Hello, son and daughter. Welcome to Old Texas Scare Podcast. I never believed in ghosts or spirits before. I always enjoyed reading about scary stories, but I was always a skeptic. But after today, I can confidently say that I do believe in spirits and in evil. After speaking to my dad about this incident with my two younger brothers, he's convinced me to write about our story and post it onto Reddit for, hopefully, some answers. I'm sorry if this is poorly written, but I'm trying to vent about the occurrence while it's still fresh in my mind. It happened about two hours ago. My family and I are actually currently on a road trip from Florida to Wyoming. Today, however, we decided to set up camp at a secluded, backwooded RV camp in the wilderness by a lake. Only one other RV was parked here, and it was all the way on the opposite side of the lake. When we first got here, we were looking around at the area, and I immediately noticed the beautiful rocks and minerals all over the place. There were so many, I then noticed a picture-perfect bundle of wheat lying on the ground. I looked online at what it is called, and it says it is called a sheaf. Well, I thought it looked nice, and my dad told me to keep it and put it in the URV as a keepsake. About three minutes later, my youngest brother, Joe, 12, came to me and told me that he found some bones by a tree. I was immediately concerned and followed him to the bones. Sure enough, there was a bone about the size of my forearm that looked a lot like a dog bone out of a cartoon and a couple of other skull-like bones. Not human skull. Beside it, mind you, these bones were in no particular formation, just in a pile. It didn't look as if it was a complete set of bones, and they were not human bones. At least not that I know of. I'd also like to add that the bones had no sort of remains on them just bone. My other brother John, 13, then came over to us and noticed the bones as well. It was extremely creepy. I had walked away and so did Joe, but while we were gone, John moved one of the bones around with his shoe, which immediately worried me. We left the area and began to just relax with family for a while. We also took a trail behind where the RV was parked. It was a nice half-mile trail, but very much in the wilderness. Later, we noticed that the sun was setting and the fireflies were coming out, so we decided to take the trail once again. But this time at sunset, we were having a great time and finally came to the point where we have to choose to take a left, right, or continue forward. We were standing there for at least a minute discussing what we should do. I had a bad feeling and told my brothers, I really don't want to continue forward or walk to the right. It's an unknown area that we haven't done. Joe replied, yeah. John was spinning in a circle for fun. We then heard a noise like a screech. Joe said quietly, what was that? Not even five seconds went by and we then heard a screech, like growl. It was not a human sound. Joe immediately bolted back to the RV and shouted, run! And me and John stood there two more seconds as we both saw with our own eyes a figure about six tall, a wide build and something in front of it which looked like a claw, a claw the size of a human head. I described it as the ends of a Native American's feather crown on their head. It was Edward Scissorhands, light. Anyway, the thing seemed to be gliding or riding something up the hill to the right where I didn't want to go in the grass on the hill. It looked like a black shadow. Mind you, all of this happened literally within a ten-second time span. From the first growl to the second and to the figure moving, John and I immediately bolted behind Joe back to the RV. I have never been so afraid for my life. I ran like the wind, so fast that I thought I'd die from tripping down the hill. As we're running back, John is shouting at me. That was probably just Dad. It's just Dad. I kept yelling, no it wasn't, and cussing like crazy out of fear. We arrived to the RV, and the first person we saw was my dad. The figure wasn't my dad. We hysterically were laughing and breathing. We were laughing because we couldn't believe we were alive and made it back to the RV, and couldn't believe what we had just witnessed. We will never forget this occurrence, and are still very much haunted by it. We were all alone in the wilderness. 
Our theories are that we upset some Native American spirit and that it wanted us away from its land. We also think that maybe it was because we disturbed items used for witchcraft by a stranger. Our last theory, strongly believed by my two brothers, is that it was a skinwalker. We don't think it was a bear because of how loud and screechy the growl was. It seemed as if it were right in our ears, even though the figure was several feet in front of us. Plus, the way it was moving was not bear-like. All we know is that we're terrified and we'll never think the same after this. We've learned our lesson about respecting items that aren't ours. And land that isn't ours. We just want to see if anyone on Reddit can give us any information on what they think it could have been. Or simply getting some comfort from others would be nice. We're currently wide awake here in the RV. I'm Genna, and I want to share my chilling encounter with a strange man in black, which I recounted on the 1997 Coast to Coast Radio show during an episode featuring Jim Keith. This unsettling incident took place back in 1991, when I was residing in the Midtown area of Sacramento. At the time, I was working on setting up a support group for people who had experienced abductions. It was early in the morning, and my husband had already left for work. I was lying in bed in a sort of twilight consciousness. Suddenly, an overwhelming paralysis came over me, and from the corner of my eye, I saw him, a tall, whitish gray man with strikingly red, painted lips. He was dressed in an all-black suit that was impeccably dark, topped with an exceptionally tall black hat resembling a cowboy hat. I couldn't recall any details about his eyes. He proceeded to sit down in the rocking chair near my bed and fixate his gaze upon me. With a sinister grin, his arm extended and transformed into an eerie, clown-like face. He said, this is who I am. I wasn't about to succumb to fear. Defiance surged through me as I attempted to muster the willpower to escape this dream, even though, in my mind, I didn't believe it was a dream at all. I mustered up my composure and sternly told him, Get out of my room! Get out of my room! You don't belong here and I never want you to return! In an instant his outstretched arm snapped back into its normal form, and the strange face vanished. He fixed his gaze on me once more and said, You will never know, and you will never tell. I reiterated my demand for him to leave my room, and he rose before me, spinning counter clockwise and disappearing into my hardwood floor, as if he'd never been there at all. The encounter left me shaken and bewildered, and it's an experience that has stayed with me to this day. I was a counselor at a high school in Las Vegas, Nevada, several years ago. One day, the principal brought two men and three piece suits and a student to my office, and asked me to register him. I will leave out some details, but as I looked at the student, I saw that the pupils of his eyes were like cat eyes. Other than that, he was normal, looking. The two men looked around my office and appeared to not notice my reaction. I asked the boy his name, and he gave me a first name. I began filling out the forms, and one of the men said they would have to come back because they were late. They left, and I heard no more about it. I told the principal that the registration had not been completed, and he merely nodded, and there was no more discussion. I've often thought about it. That was the extent of the comment. I later asked the witness if they would elaborate on the incident. The strange thing is that it was never spoken of, and I didn't mention it to anyone at school, but did tell my family. I had been following information at the time about supposed aliens at Area 50, one and just assumed that they were testing responses to the boy's eyes. He wouldn't have lasted a minute in a regular class, and I'm not sure why I didn't say something to the men about that. As I said, they just stood and looked around the office, not appearing to notice my response. Looking at him, the boy gave me a little shock, but I assumed they were from the base testing reactions. 
I thought later that this time he could probably wear contact lenses that would disguise his eyes. As I say, I was reading and following information at that time about aliens and probably took it more in stride than someone might have. I've read about others who've had experiences and were surprised that they just never mentioned or discussed it again. As a counselor, I also was trying not to hurt him by commenting on his eyes. I'm Greg Aldrich, and I want to share a rather unsettling encounter I had with some mysterious men dressed in black suits. This incident occurred several years ago when I was working as a nurse down in Salt Lake City. I called into the 1997 Coast to Coast radio show, where Jim Keith was the guest, to recount this baffling experience. One weekend, a patient came into the hospital, and from the moment I saw him, I had a hunch that he was somehow connected to the military. He had the classic short-cropped hair and an overall military appearance. It turned out that he was employed at the Dugway Proving Ground. He had sustained a broken leg while working on something there, but no matter how much I probed and questioned, I couldn't get any additional information out of him. As the time came for the patient to be transferred, two rather intimidating individuals arrived. They weren't wearing sunglasses, but they did sport black suits, and they gave off an aura of intimidation. One might have assumed they were part of the Army Corpsmen, given their appearance, but there was something about them that felt incredibly strange. What struck me as odd was that they refused to disclose where they were taking the patient. In a typical hospital transfer, we would receive copies of the patient's records to accompany them. However, these two individuals insisted on not leaving the nurse's ward with the patient. They kept him on a gurney until they had a private conversation with my nursing manager. She took them aside, and shortly afterwards she handed over the patient's records to them. What was truly peculiar was that the patient seemed to vanish without a trace. He was just gone, as if he had never been there. Nobody at the hospital had any record of him ever being a patient and the entire situation left me feeling utterly bewildered. For the past two years, me and my spouse have both been hearing each other calling our names. This only happens when one of us is out of the house for an extended period like a vacation or a few days travel without the other person. At first I was very skeptical. He said he heard my voice shouting from around the kitchen for help, and he was in the bedroom, so he didn't want to go check knowing I was not even in the same state. I pretty much left it off, thinking it was a trick of the ear, until it happened to me. He was gone for about three days. I was in the kitchen and heard baby. Help me, clear as day in his voice. I was the same way, not checking whatever that was. It recurred many times after that. Just his voice shouting while he was off on a trip. It went away after a few months, but last month I was standing in the kitchen again and heard my own voice from the bedroom calling my cats. Here, kitty cat, like it was mimicking me to try to get my cats to come into the room. My dog started freaking out and looked into the hallway with fear. I got goosebumps and have been trying my best to ignore it. Help me, please. What is this and why? What do you think it achieves from doing this? I was hunting deer alone and shot a buck from much longer range than I should have. It looked like it was badly wounded but it managed to run away. I gave chase, and for most of that, while well, it was out of my sight. After a mile or so of running, I caught sight of the buck a couple hundred feet away. The animal was not moving and had been finished off by another hunter. That person was at the buck's rear end and looked like he was humping it. I didn't even consider getting a closer look at that point. I might have had a legitimate claim to part of the buck's corpse, but claiming the meat, was the last thing on my mind. 
I bolted out of there faster than I could have managed while chasing after it, praying the whole time he didn't notice me. As long as there's crazy deer, humpers in the woods, I'm not going back there. I received a lead on a dogman encounter from a member of MUFON who had a friend that recently moved to Whitewater, Wisconsin. I arranged to meet with the Whitewater eyewitness, and here's what she kindly shared with me. It was around the fall of 2010, and I was driving home to Whitewater in the early evening. I was traveling at 55 miles per hour along a two-lane country highway, keeping an eye out for deer. Suddenly, I saw movement near my passenger side window. I slowed down a bit, fearing it might be a deer. It seemed to be down in the ditch line at first, but then it popped up next to my SUV, running alongside my vehicle and keeping up with me for about five, seven seconds. This was a tall, seven-foot dark furry being that was much taller than a human. I realized it was definitely not a deer. It looked like a big furry bear wolf creature running on two legs. It had these big pointed ears like a wolf, but much larger along with a big head and a large body. As I hit my brakes, the creature went down on all fours, bounding across the road in front of my SUV. Its back went on all fours, was even higher than the hood of my SUV. It leaped gracefully across the two lanes of the highway in just a couple of bounds and then disappeared off the roadway, running past a barn and into the woods on the other side. The creature was longer than my SUV was wide. It definitely wasn't a bear, and it wasn't a wolf. There are no bears or wolves in southern Wisconsin, except for the occasion of one passing through. After speaking with me, the eyewitness believed I was sincere and could see that I was still shaken while recalling what I had witnessed. Even eight years later, I could feel the hair standing up on my arms, and I shivered. It's worth noting that the Beast of Bray Road sightings occurred less than 20 miles away, and my sighting happened less than seven miles from Bigfoot. UFO Flying Man, that werewolf, gremlin, and our Wereboy sightings, My cousin and I were walking down the Harris River from the Harris River campground. We had been walking for about 30 to 45 minutes when my cousin thought he saw something standing out in front of us about a hundred or so feet away. When he asked me if I could see what it was, I told him I couldn't because I didn't have any contacts on or glasses. He told me it was just a stump, and I replied, I'd, okay. We went over to where we thought the thing was, and in the sand, about an inch deep, there was a footprint that looked like a man's, with a shoe size that seemed to be around 15. There were three footprints in total. About a minute later, we ran for about 10 minutes, then started walking again. Eventually, we reached the road, which was about a mile away from the picnic area where we were having a Mother's Day picnic. We started to race each other to the picnic area where our family members were. We told them about what we had seen, but for some odd reason we decided to keep it to ourselves. My story happened three years ago in 2018. I witnessed something large in Canine Crossing 6th Street near Canal Street in Milwaukee, right by the bridge near the Harley Museum. It moved on all fours and appeared to be carrying something in its mouth. I speculated it might have been a Canadian goose because the creature seemed to struggle as if it was trying to escape. The area is situated next to the water, so it could have easily caught a goose. This incident occurred at around 2.30 in the morning on January 9. The creature appeared to move awkwardly on all fours, and I observed it, when it was halfway across the road, it disappeared under the bridge after passing the bridge railing. I continued past that spot, turned my car around, and drove through the parking lot beneath the bridge, but I couldn't find anything.
This sighting dates back to the fall of 1992. A friend and I were driving back to Fairbanks from Anchorage. I was driving her 1980 Dodge Difty truck. These trucks sit very low to the ground, and it was late at night, just as we were about to reach the tourist area of Denali Park. It wasn't winter yet. Just before a corner, my headlights illuminated something sitting on the yellow line in the middle of the road. The lights on this truck were grossly out of adjustment, so they were pointing right at the object. It was sitting in the middle of the road with its legs pulled up to its chest and its arms folded over its knees. Its head was between its arms, looking toward the ground. It had long, human-like hair. At first I thought it was an orangutan, but then I thought to myself, why would an orangutan be in the middle of nowhere in Alaska? I've lived here almost all of my life, and there is no animal like this. I thought to myself, the only way it could have been an orangutan is if there's a circus out here and I knew that was not a possibility in such a remote area. I drove right next to it, and I was at its level. If I had been going slowly, I could have easily touched it. I was freaked out and thought I must be seeing things. Maybe I was tired. My friend saw it too, although neither of us said a word until we reached the gas station in the town of Healy, just past Denali. She said, did you see that? And I said, I thought I was seeing things. This spooked us so much that we didn't even talk about it until we were around other people. We have talked about this and still agree that we saw this thing. We were about to give up on trying to explain it to anyone else because no one believes us. We both have decided not to bring it up because no one believes it anyway. What I find so unusual is that there's no native Alaskan animal that could resemble this thing in any way. We have bears, moose, caribou, porcupines, rabbits, etc. But none of these animals have knees or long reddish-colored hair. I don't know how to explain it, and I've given up trying because nobody believes it. They just think you're joking. I don't want to be harassed by any skeptics. I just want to be able to share my genuine experience in case others have seen what I have. My sighting took place in March 2018 near the village of Rochester, Wisconsin. It was around 11 p.m. and I had left my home to make a short trip to Walmart to pick up some items my fiancé needed for work the next day, mainly lunch foods and underarm deodorant. Rochester, Wisconsin is located in southeast Wisconsin alongside the Fox River between two nature preserves. It consists mainly of forested land with hills and a few open fields. As I was on my way to Walmart, there's a hill that must be climbed before leveling out at the top. At the top of the hill is a small gravel pull, off named Honey Creek. While I was coming up the hill and around a slight curve, I noticed something standing in the middle of the road a little before the pull-off. My immediate reaction was, why is that huge dog just standing there? And what is going on? My next thought was, that's the biggest black German shepherd I have ever seen. As I got a little closer to this animal, I hit it with my bright beams, completely illuminating it. At that point, this creature stared at me for about four or five seconds, and then reared back on its hind legs, standing on only its back legs. It turned around to face the way it came from. Leaped, yes, leaped into the ditch and shot off like it was fired out of a cannon, disappearing into the tree line. The color of this animal was completely black. It had very long front legs, and its back hindquarters were very muscular, somewhat resembling a pit bull's body physique, but much larger. The head of this creature looked similar to a shepherd or wolf, but the muzzle was wider and resembled that of a bulldog, rather than a wolf or shepherd. When it stood up and turned, it was still facing and glaring at me, but I was able to briefly see what I can only describe as shoulders like a hominid and what appeared to be pectoral muscles under a very thin layer of fur or hair, much shorter than on the rest of its body so thin that it seemed, like you could almost see the skin. Despite all this, I personally felt no fear. 
just confusion and then amazement at how fast it moved. I don't know what these things are, but I can now confidently assure you they are real. Thank you. I had a dog named Silver Chief. When he was a puppy, I was a baby. We grew up together. I had graduated high school when he died. Anyway, that dog was not afraid of anything man or beast. We had been having some chickens killed at night and thought it might be a fox or something. One night I heard the chicken hollering, so I grabbed a flashlight and a twenty-two caliber rifle and ran to the chicken house. It was dark, but I saw a huge white cat like creature jump over the chicken wire fence. It was seven feet high. I went in and there were six dead chickens. It was not long after that on another night I heard my dog barking. I could tell by his bark he had something treed. All of a sudden he screamed and ran back to the house. He had never run from anything. My brother got the twenty-two and walked up into the woods. He was walking around and heard claws scratching on tree bark. He looked up right into the eyes of what we called a wampus cat. It was getting ready to pounce on him. My brother, who was an excellent hunter, just threw the rifle barrel up without taking time to aim and shot the cat right through the head. He brought the cat home, and I had never seen anything like it. It was solid yellow or white colored, had long three or four inch fur and a tail about four or five inches long. Even with a short tail, it was three feet long from nose to tail. We skinned him, salted his skin, and stretched it on the barn door. I remember that we used to hear it screaming in the swamp at night. Sometimes it sounded like a woman screaming, and sometimes it sounded like a baby crying. I've never seen anything like it before or since. It had huge teeth that had grooves in the gums and lips on the opposite of the teeth. It had had huge feet. Here is a drawing I saw several years ago. Most people don't believe we actually killed it till they saw its hide on the barn door. The memory lingers in the recesses of my mind, a vivid snapshot frozen in time. I was twelve, sitting in the passenger seat of my mother's car on a chilly morning. The clock in the car read 7 a.m. as we navigated the familiar route to the train station before school. Little did I know that this ordinary morning would carve a lasting imprint on my memory. As the car glided down the empty road, a figure materialized in front of us. A slender woman draped in a flowing white gown with long dark hair that cascaded like a waterfall down her back. Her presence ethereal and out of place sent shivers down my spine. Instinctively I yelled for my mother to stop, my heart pounding with the fear that she would collide with the mysterious woman. But my mother continued driving, oblivious to the spectral figure in our path. I watched in horror as the woman remained unmoved, standing in the middle of the road. It felt like an eternity passed, the car hurtling toward her, and I braced for impact. And then, as suddenly as she appeared, the woman vanished, dissipating into thin air. Breathless and bewildered, I turned to my mother. Did you see her, the woman in the white gown? I asked, my voice trembling with a mixture of fear and confusion. My mother glanced at me, a furrow forming on her brow. What are you talking about? I didn't see anyone. Are you sure you're feeling okay? But I knew what I had seen. The image of the spectral woman, her form stark against the early morning light, was etched into my mind. The encounter left me with an eerie feeling, a question lingering in the air like a ghostly whisper. Why had I seen something that my mother hadn't? Now eight years have passed, and the memory remains vivid, as if it happened yesterday. I've never encountered anything like that since, and the incident has become a haunting enigma in the tapestry of my life. Theories have crossed my mind. Was it a glimpse into another realm, a fleeting connection with the supernatural, or merely a figment of an overactive imagination? 
The woman in the white gown has become a specter that accompanies my thoughts, a mystery I carry with me into adulthood. The rational part of me dismisses it as a trick of the mind, a momentary lapse in perception. Yet there's a lingering doubt, a nagging sensation that the encounter held a significance beyond the ordinary. As I reflect on that morning, the questions persist. Was she a spirit from the past, a residual echo in the fabric of time, or a messenger of something beyond our comprehension? The encounter may remain unsolved, but the woman in the white gown will forever be a haunting presence, a mysterious chapter in the story of my life that refuses to fade away. This happened to me probably six or so years ago, and I'm still extremely confused on what happened. I just found this sub, so maybe I can get some clarity. So to set the scene, I was camping with about five other friends along the South Holston River in the Appalachian Mountains of East Tennessee. It was probably around two in the morning when this happened. Me and one of my friends slept in a couple of hammocks, while the rest of the group were split up into a couple of tents that were maybe 15 feet away. I was the only one awake at the time, but I was just about to fall asleep. Suddenly, I hear this insane noise. It sounded like a man letting out a loud, deep scream at the top of his lungs as if he was in pain. At first, it sounded about 20 feet away, but I heard it move extremely quickly through the middle of the campsite right between where I was sleeping and where my friends in tents were. It was just a few feet from me as it went by. Once it passed through the camp, the noise stopped. It only lasted maybe three, four seconds. Despite the fact that whatever making the noise was clearly moving through the camp very quickly, there was no sound of hurried footsteps, leaf crunching, or anything like that to indicate that something was moving. It was only the sound of screaming, it woke everyone up, and we were all terrified. We got up and looked around camp, but there was no sign of anything passing through. We thought maybe it was a type of bird, since there were no footsteps, but none of us had been able to find any bird from the area that makes a sound anywhere close to that. Our first theory was a screech owl, but we looked up what they're called sound like, and it definitely wasn't one of those. We all agreed that it sounded like a man, but it was too fast for a person. We thought maybe something like a deer, bear, or mountain lion, but we would have undoubtedly heard some footsteps if it was. We are completely out of theories at this point. Does anyone have any thoughts on what could possibly explain what we heard? Okay, so I don't know if this thing happens to you or not, but it definitely happened with me. I was in my college first year, and I, along with my friends, smoked some weed, and I was pretty high at that moment, and it was like my first or second time smoking it. And I don't know how, but I was able to read the lips or the mind of the people. After smoking it, I was going back to my home on my bike, then my brother called me up that he is also free, and his college was very near to mine. So I went to catch him up. He was with his friend, and his group was coming out of the college gate. They were just talking about their day. My brother then noticed me, waved his hand to me, to which I also waved my hand. I was around 25 to 30 meters away from him, and many. Students were passing through, and between then, a girl from his group said that the shirt I'm wearing... Looks very good on me. I don't know how, but I heard her there. There was a lot of rush there, and they were talking in between them, only. My brother came to me, and then we both were going back to our home. On our way home, I was riding the bike, knowing that I was not in my mind. I saw two of my college mates were also going home by their car, and one of them said to another, Is he from our college? As they were unable to identify me, Coz, I was wearing a helmet, and I was behind their car, and I just saw their heads, and I recognized them. I moved on. I reached home, ate food, and the next day I asked my brother that his friend was really talking about my shirt, to which he was literally shocked. And he asked me who told you this, and I replied him, no one, because I don't even know a single person, 
other than him in his college. I showed him my recent chats he wasn't ready to believe. Then I went to the college and I asked the same guy who was asking about me in the car. He was also very surprised that how could I even listen to what they were saying because they were playing music in the car at that time. He wasn't ready to believe and said that I read his lips or whatever. I don't know what happened to me, but that was a crazy experience like I was able to read or listen to what other people were talking about me. Does this happen to anyone else? If yes, then please let me know. A few years back, I was a Marine Reservist. My particular job involves being outdoors a lot, especially at night in the middle of nowhere. We never saw anything super spooky, but did have some interesting things happen. This particular drill weekend, we go up to a lake in North Georgia. We're going to be doing some amphib stuff and a training patrol. This was the first and only time in my six-year contract that we weren't doing this sort of thing on a military installation. We were out on a public lake and going to be patrolling through private properties. Apparently higher-ups had informed local police and residents, but I'm not exactly sure how effective they were in that. We were all excited because for the first time we were really going to be using stealth skills in facing credible compromise instead of headquarters playing bad guys. Coming to find us after we give our current GPS coordinates over the radio. Anyway, we load up on the Zodiacs about midnight and ride for about 30 minutes. We slip into the water and fin to our designated spot where we catch AR safety vests and fins, booties, etc. It's about 1 a.m. on a Friday night. We start patrolling toward our objective and realize we are pretty close to some houses along the edge of the lake. We can't see them, but we can see light coming off of them over the hill, etc. It's early summer, it's been dry, and there are vines everywhere. We're trying to be quiet, but we have a dude carrying a sniper rifle, a guy with a law rocket trainer T-boned across the top of his ruck, and it's dark as balls. We are snagging vines everywhere, crunching leaves, making way more noise than we want to. We hear voices down at a private dock about 150 miles away and see a boat rounding the corner. It looks like a pontoon boat they were partying on. It has all the little party lights set up and some quiet music playing. We decided to go a little deeper into the woods and try to move around them because we don't want to wait for them to dock the boat and walk up to the house. Apparently, they hear us because the music cuts off. They kill the engine and spotlights start shining up in the woods. We freeze and wait. Lights go out. We wait about 20 minutes and try moving very slowly. Spotlights immediately come back on. Boat has drifted closer. We wait about 30 more minutes and try moving again. This time, floodlights come on at the top of the hill where the house is. Faintly coming up from the water, I hear somebody yelling, I'll shoot. I was scared to piss. We are way out in redneck country, and I can only imagine what somebody would do if late at night they saw six men with military uniforms, faces painted, rucks, night vision, goggles, and R's in their backyard. Probably think the Russians were invading and unload with the old 36 Lowell. We have AM-4s, Yes, but never get ammo on training missions, and we are in the wrong regardless. I specifically. Remember my team leaders circling us up and hissing. These people are trying to F us, and we aren't going to let it happen. We ended up out, waiting them and slipping around. No harm, no foul. So glad we didn't get shot at by some good Americans doing their civic duty. Later that same op, we had just settled in to our hide site. As the sun was coming up and we're doing all the stuff associated with that, we were about a mile from any house at this point, deep in the woods. Shortly after sunrise, I'm leaned up against my ruck trying to get some sleep while team leader gets all his shit done, and we all hear footsteps. Everyone freezes, then starts slowly packing shit up in case we have to run. About 50 yards away, I see this middle-aged guy come trotting through the trees. He's white. Average height, slight gut, 
balding and sweaty as ever. Weird thing about him is he's way out here running through the open woods wearing some dirty khaki slacks, a gray wife beater, and some black dressy shoes. He's also filthy with what looks like engine grease, like he's been working on a car. We sat in our little ditch and watched him run past us. He came within about twenty, thirty feet of us, but was totally oblivious. Never saw him after that. Still wonder what the hell he was doing out there and how funny it would have been if he had ran up in the middle of us. In all my many hours in the woods, all over this country, he's probably the most mysterious thing I've encountered. The annual family road trip from Scotland to Switzerland was a tradition deeply embedded in our summer vacations. The adventure was always peppered with scenic landscapes, charming pit stops, and the thrill of experiencing different cultures. However, one particular journey remains etched in my memory, not for its picturesque vistas or cultural escapades, but for an eerie encounter at the Swiss border. Our journey progressed seamlessly as we traversed through England, hopped onto the Channel Ferry, and spent a night in Calais. The next day, with the Swiss Alps beckoning us, we resumed our drive. The road unwound ahead of us, weaving through quaint villages and rolling hills. However, a hiccup emerged in the form of unexpected roadworks, causing a slight delay in our meticulously planned itinerary. As dusk cloaked the landscape, we approached the Swiss border. Our excitement mingled with the weariness of a long day's drive. The border crossings were usually routine affairs, mere checkpoints with a handful of guards conducting a swift inspection of the vehicles. The open borders within the European Union meant no passport checks, making the process quick and hassle-free. Our tired but eager caravan pulled up to the checkpoint in the darkness. Expecting the routine inspection to facilitate our seamless entry into Switzerland. However, a peculiar scene unfolded before us. The checkpoint was deserted. Not a single soul manned the station, and an eerie silence hung in the air. The buildings, typically illuminated in the evening, stood in complete darkness. It was an unusual sight, and a chill ran down my spine as I scanned the area. Despite the apparent abandonment, signs of life were scattered around. Jackets were casually draped over chairs, indicating abrupt departure. The glow of a television flickered from within the main building, a stark contrast to the lifeless surroundings. My dad, who had taken the wheel for this leg of the journey, slowed down to a crawl, but didn't come to a complete stop. The unsettling ambiance prompted an instinctual reluctance to linger in this deserted checkpoint. As we rolled through, the silence enveloped us, and a palpable tension filled the car. No explanation presented itself for the unattended border post. It was an enigma, a strange interlude in our routine pilgrimage to Switzerland. We passed through without incident, the border disappearing into the rearview mirror as the night swallowed its mysteries. To this day, the memory lingers as a perplexing anomaly a chapter in our family's travel saga that defied explanation. The deserted Swiss border checkpoint, with its silent buildings and unattended posts, remains a lingering mystery, a whispered story of the night our journey took an unexpected turn into the unknown. I had a regular patch of government woods in a river bottom where a buddy and I would go hunting for feral hogs. We would walk in, find fresh sign, freshly rooted ground and feces, then try to track them to their bedding areas. It was generally accepted that it was a bad idea to go alone, as waking hogs in their bedding areas can get pretty dangerous. On the day of a planned hunt, my buddy canceled. I had my day pack ready and my vehicle loaded. I decided I would just go alone. I began my walk into the woods in high spirits. About two miles in, I found fresh sign. A lot of it, it was a cool morning, and steam could be seen rising from the fecal matter. 
There was wet mud caked at varying heights at the base of many trees, indicating a large sounder of pigs. I followed the sign and passed through several sloughs that wound through the river bottom. I had the entire place mapped out on my smartphone, GPS, but found myself going deeper in than we had previously been. Pigs can cover ridiculous amounts of ground, and hours later I was still stalking them. Thick cloud cover set in, and I lost my service. No big deal, I always marked my trail as a backup. I happened upon an area where there was a large amount of sawtooth oak. The ground was spattered with blood and chunks of flesh with pig hair still attached. I found the full length of a pigtail that had been ripped off in a fight over the abundant acorns. I estimated I had two hours until dark and decided I had better just head back. Being stuck in that swamp in the dark alone didn't seem appealing. I didn't make it very far before a heavy downpour started. So heavy I could barely see. My choices were limited. Try to plot on and get out of there, or wait for the rain to stop so I could see my trail markers better. Not knowing when the rain would let up, I chose the former. Big mistake. I quickly found myself turned around and lost my trail. Not yet panicked, I broke out the compass and began making my way north toward the river. I hit a slaw, crossed it, hit another, and crossed it. Then another. What the FBI said aloud as I hit the fourth slough. I didn't cross this many in rapid succession on my way in. I was getting nervous by now. Invisibility was vanishing rapidly. Suddenly the sound of scuffling earth and the squeals of fighting hogs broke out about fifty. Yards out, dark was descending on me and I couldn't see them. My flashlight was useless. The cover was too thick. I shouldered my rifle and drew my three hundred fifty-seven Magnum with a six barrel. Should I fire a shot to scare them off? Fire three as and souls in case there were other hunters around. Option one, I fired a round into the dirt. The squeals and scuffling stopped. Dead silence. Shouldn't I have heard them run off? Maybe the wet mud silenced their exit. I moved forward slowly, holding both my flashlight and revolver in front of me. I stumbled into a wallowing area. I scanned the mud, viewing hog prints of many sizes. Several bigger than my closed fist. Damn it! An angry, guttural groan sounded to my left. I positioned a large oak between myself and the sound and shined my flashlight in its direction. Nothing. Then I saw it, the base of a cypress tree, cut up from the rubbing of tusks. The marks were over two feet up the trunk. Big boar. The scuffling started again, this time ahead of me, in the direction I had to go. Slowly I moved on always keeping large trees in my path in case I got charged. Long moments of silence were occasionally broken by snorts, squeals, grunts, and scuffling. It was as though they knew where I was going and were intent on staying just ahead of me. Three hours after dark, I finally reached the river and followed it back to my truck. I experienced a pretty big adrenaline crash when I got there and never conducted another solo hog hunt in those woods. On December 4th, 2005, at approximately 8.15 a.m., I was standing about 50 yards from the southwest corner boundary marker of my property when I heard the neighbor's dog start to bark and head southward toward Arkansas Highway 7. They only ran a short distance before stopping. I immediately thought they must be barking at a deer crossing the road. My initial instinct was to get my gun from my truck but then I remembered I had parked outside the fence in front of my house. So I decided to stand there and observe, hoping to determine if it was a doe or a buck and that it wouldn't feel pressured since the dogs had stopped barking. I believed the deer might change direction if it saw me hurrying in its same general direction. Therefore, I stood still and waited, hoping to catch a glimpse of it. If the dogs remained quiet, I planned to hunt it later. Only one of the dogs got to see it for two to three seconds, but I saw it clearly. My initial impression was that I was observing a very large man wearing a hooded parka. Then I realized it was some kind of animal. 
It was about 50 yards away on the opposite side of an old fence that had been overtaken by grass, weeds, and vines. I only had a left-side view of it as it was traveling east along an old fence row, covering a distance of about 20 yards. In just three seconds, I could only see its upper body. I could tell it was not a bear, but I couldn't make out distinct facial features from the side. It resembled an ape in some ways, but its posture appeared more man-like. I can best describe its size by comparing it to a very large man I know who is approximately six feet nine inches tall and weighs 280 pounds. This creature was at least that tall, possibly a little taller, but close to that same build. I did not get a long view of it, and I probably wouldn't have had time to take a picture even if I had a camera in my hand. It was moving at a brisk pace, but not lightning fast with a stride resembling a trot or jog. The body moved quickly, but there's no up and down motion. From what I could tell, it appeared to have a moderately thick coat of black hair, and its face was dark, as if there was some hair on it. It was moving through a well-used deer crossing near an old fence row on both sides of Arkansas Highway 7. The west fence row had recently been cleared, while the east side was logged about five years ago and has a fair amount of undergrowth and a game trail running along the south side of the fence row. Just a little to the southwest of the spot, there's a thicket approximately three acres in size. There are a couple of partial open areas in the woods there, and in most parts of this thicket, one can walk through fairly easily, while in some places it is too thick to move through without clippers and or a machete. I did not see where the creature crossed Arkansas Highway 7, but it most likely came from an area about 40 yards away from the highway's west side right. Of way, I believe that this creature waited until there were no cars coming before crossing the road. I did not get the impression that it was running from something. I have mentally replayed the entire scenario many times, and I have stood and looked at the same area where the creature was seen. I looked for tracks after the incident, but the ground was too brushy for obvious tracks. I've stood in a spot where I observed the creature from, watched vehicles travel north along Arkansas Highway 7, and considered every possible scenario. It wasn't any kind of illusion. I was there, and I saw it. would just like to start by saying that I am new to Reddit, and this is my first post, so please bear with me if I am not doing this right. This story I am about to share is actually why I joined Reddit on my quest, to find out if this has happened to anyone else. This is 100% true, and is really hard for me to share, because any time I have tried to tell someone else about it, I get laughed at and accused of just trying to pull their leg. I recently seen an article about a woman who was hunting and seen an invisible or cloaked creature that she described it almost like a predator from the movie of the same name. I read her story and seen the picture she took of, said Predator. Now, as for her picture, I personally think it is a combination of flair from the sun and a close-up of possibly her face or something. I am not dismissing her story, though, actually quite the opposite, since I too have encountered something similar, and is what prompted me to seek out if anyone else has encountered a predator in the woods. Now on to my encounter. When I was about five years old, I was playing by the edge of the woods behind my grandmother's house. I played there often, and my grandma just kept an eye on me from the kitchen or living room, because the house had huge windows that faced the woods. She would come out every once in a while just to see what I was up to. I was obsessed with digging in the dirt and collecting unusual rocks and arrowheads that littered the land where my grandmother lived. I should mention this is Midwest Illinois, not too far from Cahokia Mounds, so finding arrowheads was actually not that uncommon. Anyway, that day I remember picking out a spot to dig. I had been out there for quite a while because I remember I had a pretty decent sized hole going when something caught my eye up in the tree that I was next to. I almost don't know how to explain it, 
but it looked like almost a heat wave coming off the branch of the tree. It was fall. I remember this because I had my pink jacket on and remember thinking that my mom was going to be pissed because I had dirt around the bottom of the arms from digging. I also remember there being a lot of leaves on the ground. Anyway, I am staring at this heat wave and realize it has a human shape. So here I am, five years old, and wondering why there is an invisible man in the tree. I remember feeling scared but unsure what to do. Then it started moving and making a faint clicking sound. That is about the time that I decided that I was not supposed to be seeing this, and I hightailed it back to the house. My grandmother seen I was pretty shaken, and I remember telling her that I'd just seen an angel. In my five-year-old mind, I didn't know what else it could be. I had never heard of aliens or ghosts or monsters, so to me it had to be an angel because that's all my little mind could think of. Fast forward to when I'm about 12 years old. By this time, the encounter was way out of mind. I loved watching action and sci-fi movies. My dad rented a movie called Predator. I'm watching it with him, and the first time you see the Predator, invisible or cloaked eye about shit my pants, all the memories from that day digging the dirt came flooding back. I even asked my dad if Predator was real or if he knew if anyone or any animal that had cloaking ability that I didn't know about. He told me it was all fake. It wasn't like it is today where I could just Google it. I had no access to the Internet, so again, I just put it out of my mind. Again, fast forward to about the year 2004. I am grown. I have three small children. I just went through a separation from my husband. I moved to the next town over to an apartment with my kids. These apartments are all one-level duplexes with there being five buildings. I am at the very last apartment of the last building. The apartments are considered in town, but are on the outskirts. There is a deep ditch that runs behind the buildings with a chain-link fence that separates the backyard from the ditch. There are about six, seven trees on our side of the fence. If you follow the ditch a little bit, you hit a small forest that eventually leads to the country with a larger forest and farmland. I am a smoker, but would not smoke in the apartment because of the kids, so I often went out to the back porch. One night I was up late doing laundry and stuff after the kids went to bed. I decided to take a smoke break before I myself went to sleep. I am back there on the porch, and I started hearing this faint clicking sound. I immediately looked to the ditch because I had seen a groundhog out there a few days before and thought perhaps he was out there again. The yard is faintly lit from the outside light that is by the playground that is to the right of my back porch. I didn't turn on my porch light. I didn't normally. If I was just going out for a quick smoke, I didn't see any groundhog or movement from the ditch, so I go back to smoking my cigarette. The faint clicking sound keeps happening, and a slight shift of movement makes me look up into the tree to the left of my porch. It's there. The same invisible thing I had seen when I was five. It is like a distortion and in a humanoid shape. It is crouched down on the branch with an arm out holding onto the trunk of the tree. I couldn't believe it. I was like, is this happening? As it came to kill me from me seeing it all those years ago. All I could think about was my kids in the apartment sleeping. I ran in and slammed and locked the door. I ran to the kids' rooms and made sure all the windows are locked. Then I just turn out the lights in the living room and stare out the blinds at the tree to see if I could catch another glimpse of it. I sat there for about a good ten minutes and couldn't see anything. I began to think that I am just tired and my mind was playing tricks on me. Just as I was finally talking myself down, my neighbor's dog comes running across the yard and starts barking at the tree, at the same branch that I had seen this predator thing. That pretty much freaked me out because this dog was not a barker. I actually have never heard him bark at anything, even at the groundhog that had been hanging out at the ditch. This barking went on for a few minutes until I hear the neighbor lady, who owns the dog, call him back inside. The dog reluctantly turned to go back home, stopping every few feet to look back at the branch of the tree until he was out of my sight. 
I didn't sleep that night and have never seen anything like it again. I don't know what to think of it. I am a grown woman. I have kids and a good career. I just want to know if anyone else has ever had an experience like this. I know what I saw, believe it or not. Thanks for taking the time to read this. I am sorry I am on mobile, so I hope that the formatting on this isn't horrible. I live Desert Hot Springs, a city a few miles away from Palm Springs, California. The first experience I remember is when I was about six years old. I was playing on a table while watching TV. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a girl walking into my room. I remember excitedly calling out for my cousin, thinking it was her. That moment, my mom pops out of the kitchen to tell me no one is home but us. A few years later, in a different home, I get home from school and go in my room to play video games. I set myself on my bed, and a few minutes later, I feel like someone jumped on my bed. I pretended I didn't feel anything and just kept playing. A few months later, I feel something wake me up. I see a face next to mine. I shut my eyes, hoping to go back to sleep, but of course it's not happening. I quickly get up and turn on the light. I never moved faster in my life. Those were the major experiences. There's quite a few small things that happened. Funny thing a few months ago, my aunt asked me if I felt any sort of presence in that house. I wasn't the only one that experienced possible paranormal activity in that house. Maybe eight years later in my mom's current home, around 10 p.m., my mom calls out scared that something climbed over the wall into our yard. Now at the time, there was only a few homes and miles and miles. Of nothing but desert, I go outside with a rifle, thinking maybe it was a pack of coyotes, trying to get our small dog, since there was reports of coyotes attacking pets around the area. She tells me to come back inside, quick and tells me what she saw. She described it as a black mass or a blob, completely shapeless. My girlfriend and I were out. Before I left, I asked if she needed a ride home, and she said no. I had a bad feeling about leaving without her, but I have bad anxiety and brushed it off as just that. As soon as my car hit the road from the parking lot, this image popped into my head. I saw my girlfriend's car in a mangled mess with a black SUV. The front ends of both cars were destroyed. I pushed it out of my mind and continued on chalking it up to anxiety. The next morning, I was informed that my girlfriend had been in a severe head on collision. She survived, but the people in the other car didn't. When the police report was released, I saw that the other car was a black SUV. I wasn't a believer in visions, etc. Previously, but this seems too much to be a coincidence. I know I can't blame myself, but there's always this guilt that had I listened to that bad feeling or vision or whatever, two people could still be alive. Do you think this was some sort of VSP or... When I was about 13 years old, I went trout fishing with my mother and aunt on the White River in Arkansas. We were staying at a motel in Bull Shoals. One morning, we drove to a remote area of the river to fish by an unknown dirt road. We stopped to fish a bend of the river. On the opposite side of the river, which was to the west, there was a tall stone bluff with a slight overhang from erosion. On the east side, there was flatter land with 12 to 20 foot thin. Scrub trees about 20 to 30 feet from the water, as the river was low. While my mother and aunt were fishing off the bank, I decided to try my luck further up the river, about 300 yards away and just out of sight from my mother. While I was fishing along the bank, I began to hear rustling sounds in the trees and shrubs behind me. I looked in the direction of the noise and could see the tops of these thin trees moving, as if something were walking through them and pushing them to the side. Due to the thickness of the vegetation, I couldn't see what was actually moving the trees. 
I stood and observed this activity for two to three minutes. I began hearing grunting-type sounds that were very deep and substantial. These sounds were similar but different from the grunt sounds a bull would make. The movement of the trees began to appear as if something were shaking the trees at this point. And instead of moving through them, it seemed that whatever was making the noises was only about ten feet inside the brush. Yet I couldn't see what it was. Feeling nervous, I noticed that whatever was in the brush seemed to move with me step for step as I walked. The movement in the trees became more forceful, with the sounds of large branches breaking as it moved. When I got within sight of my mom, which was about fifty yards away, all activity stopped. I informed my mother that there was something in the brush following me, but of course she shrugged it off. Within a few moments we decided to leave, as we were not catching any fish. The anticipation was palpable as I finalized the purchase of my new hunting property deep in the rugged Texas wilderness. The land was untamed, teeming with game, and a thrill for any hunter like me. Little did I know that this new acquisition would lead to a horrifying encounter that would haunt me for the rest of my days. I quickly set up trail cameras throughout the dense forest, eager to get a sense of the wildlife on my new land. The first few weeks were uneventful, capturing images of deer, raccoons, and the occasional bear. But one crisp autumn morning, as I checked the latest trail camera photos, my excitement turned to unease. There, amidst the ordinary animal captures, was a picture that sent chills down my spine. It was a dark, massive figure, covered in fur with a human-like face, staring with its gray, dead eyes directly into the camera. It was unmistakable, a Sasquatch, the legendary creature that had been whispered about in hushed tones by hunters and locals for generations. My heart pounded as I examined the photo over and over. Surely it was some weirdo in a costume, perhaps an inbred black bear, I kept making excuses as to what it was in order to comfort myself. I knew the consequences of sharing this with anyone. I'd be ridiculed, deemed a madman. Obviously, no one would believe me. So naturally, the need to prove what I had seen gnawed at me. Determined to find answers, I decided to venture into the woods with my loyal hunting dog, Max, by my side. The day was overcast, the forest eerily silent as Max and I hiked deeper into the woods. The anticipation weighed heavily on me. As excited as I may have been, I was terrified. Deep down, though, I figured I probably wouldn't even encounter it. Hours passed, and the sun began its descent. Just as I had given up hope, we heard it, a low, guttural growl resonating through the trees. My hand instinctively went to the rifle slung over my shoulder. I signaled for Max to stay close, but the faithful dog growled, his hackles raised. Suddenly it emerged from the shadows. That familiar, massive, dark figure covered in matted black fur with piercing eyes that held a deep, primal intelligence. It was said Sasquatch, and it had found us. Fear gripped me hard, and my heart raced as I raised my rifle not intending to harm the creature, but only to ward it off. The Sasquatch, with a speed that defied its size, lunged forward, its massive arms closing around Max. My loyal dog let out a heart-wrenching yelp as the creature's grip tightened. I fired my rival, but missed completely as the beast flew about the thick woods, carrying my buddy, Max, in its filthy grip. The world seemed to slow down, and I watched in abject horror as Max was being torn apart by the monstrous beast. The Sasquatch's eyes bore into mine an intelligence in them that sent a shiver down my spine. With Max's lifeless body cradled in its arms, the Sasquatch turned and vanished back into the forest, leaving behind a shaken and anguished hunter. I was left in the darkening woods, the weight of guilt and grief pressing down on me. I wanted to cry, but yet I was emotionless. I'd sought proof, but the cost was higher than I could have ever imagined. 
As I made my way back to my cabin, the forest's once familiar beauty now held a sinister aura. The Sasquatch was no longer a legend. It was a brutal reality that had torn my world apart, and I would forever be haunted by the memory of that fateful encounter. The chilling scream of the Sasquatch echoed in my ears, a reminder that the line between myth and reality had blurred, and the forest held secrets more terrifying than I had ever imagined. Hi, I'm contacting you along with a few other men of God as I saw something in the night sky with my own two eyes. I'm a reformed Christian. My faith is in Christ Jesus alone, and I believe in the inerrant word of God. I've been researching what I saw since it happened, and I cannot with absolute certainty determine what it was or its meaning. It's very important to me to know how to proceed from here, and I'm contacting you to see if you have any information or wisdom about this and what I should do with it. I live in Slave Lake, Alberta, Canada, and there were many, many fires burning during this time. I'm now going to give you the details below. I was still awake late on the evening of August 13, 2023 and I remembered that the Perseids meteor shower was happening on August 12 as I was still up. I thought that I'd go outside onto my deck and observe the sky and maybe catch a glimpse of the meteor shower. It was a clear, calm night with no wind. It was a warm night, and the night sky was crystal clear. I saw a couple of satellites go by very high in the sky. They were the size of pin dots. I was initially looking south. I then turned my eyes to look northwest, and I could see the Big Dipper. I then looked west and saw an orangey, silver-edged, glowing sphere of light that was extremely brightly lit, and the colors were moving and swirling within it. I thought to myself, it looks weird, as I was puzzled. As it got closer to my house and to where I was on the deck, it continued traveling on a straight course, not turning or varying its height. It made no sound. It came from the western sky and went east. As it came closer, it definitely appeared to be the likeness of a bird, a large fiery orange bird. This bird was mainly orange, a fiery orange with silvery white flickering along the edges of its entire body and wings, and the colors we were constantly undulating within. It, its body, and entire being appeared to be statically, electrically charged. The orange and bright electric white would move and undulate, and the colors would move and vary as well. It was very bright and very obviously a bird type of thing or being. It had a medium long neck, and I could see it turn its head to look down to its left towards the street and neighbors below it. It would alternate from looking straight ahead to looking down to its left. It was going east. It appeared to be looking at the street below along my front yard and neighbors along both sides of my street. It did not seem that it saw me, nor did it look at me or towards me. Its neck glowed a purple gray and its eyes lit up and looked electric blue or white. It never flapped its wings, yet it was able to maintain the same speed in height or altitude. Yet I had to approximate how high up it was, I would say about one kilometer. It appeared to be between two to three inches wide in the sky. If I were to hold up my arm, extend my hand out, and use my index finger and thumb to measure it in the sky. Throughout this time, I was struggling to comprehend what I was seeing. I watched it, and it continued going east until I lost sight of it. This happened on August 13, 2023, from 11.55 p.m. to August 14, 12.04 a.m., 2023. I swear what I've shared is true. I'm sure you're wondering about my character as a person. I can assure you I'm not some nut looking for attention. I'm a non-smoker, non-drinker, and have never done drugs and am not taking any prescription medication. I'm of sound mind and spirit. I'm sending this to you, and I'm asking you if you can advise me as to what I saw and 
What do I do with this observation? I was on a late night hike in a local forest known for coyotes ganging up on humans. It was a full moon and we were chilling out smoking underneath the moon. I'm on the phone talking to my grandpa and he's telling me he's lighting a fat one up for me. And I hear this rustling in the brush next to me. I turn around and the guys with me start screaming bloody murder. I turn around to see a fox yelling and running past them as the men are running towards the fox and scaring themselves and the fox even more. It has taken me a long time to come forward with what happened to me that day, but I feel that I am ready to finally tell all. It happened years ago in the month of October back in 1998. I and my family lived in a rural area of West Yorkshire in a village called Bramham. It's a countryside area with lots of farms, a quarry, and some rivers and streams. I liked to walk my dog around the lanes and tracks as it was a way for me to wind down and get some air. I had finished work on that particular evening. I'm out walking with my dog on a long farm track, a route we often take. It was early evening. So it was about 8 p.m., and it had gotten dark. I and the dog are just walking along. I let the dog off the lead so he could have a run, as we were about half a mile up this single farm track by then. And there were no animals or people around, so I let him have a sniff around, as I walked, the dog was just doing his own thing. It was quiet, with no sign of anyone around. I was enjoying the walk. There are hedges on both sides of the track the whole way, so it's hard to see clearly into the fields, and there are some woods to one side of me. As we walked even further along the track, the dog suddenly stopped. He froze and looked up the track in the direction we were walking. He must be aware of something up there as he starts growling and acting all strange. His hackles are up, and he growls continuously. At that point, I thought it must be a fox, which is the way he'd acted before, if we came across one. So I'm looking at the track to try and see a fox. I can't see anything anywhere. No fox, no cat, or any other animal. I can see how worked up he is, as now he is going mad and starts barking loudly. I had carried on walking, so by this point he was a short way behind me. So I turn to the dog to try and calm him, but he won't stop. If anything, he's getting worse. Something had really spooked him, so I turned to look up the track, and I couldn't believe my eyes. Standing there looking at us was this thing. A massive creature stood there looking back in our direction. It must have walked between eight to nine foot steps out onto the field track before I had seen it, and now I can see it clearly. And it can see us. At this point, I was in complete shock at what I was seeing. I kept thinking, it can't be real. I honestly don't think my brain could process what I was seeing because standing there on the field track was a huge creature of some kind. It was massively built and was about five feet wide across the shoulders and about eight feet tall. I couldn't make out any facial features as the face was in shadow, but I could make out that it was covered in hair. It was standing about 30 meters from me so I could see it clearly, but I could not make out any features even from that distance. It made no sound and I never smelled or heard anything. To my disbelief, at that moment the dog runs straight towards it, the dog's barking as he runs in its direction. But the dog stopped about 15 meters away from this thing. He was clearly scared and just didn't know how to react. He had completely forgotten about me. And that's a first for my dog. Usually, he would put my needs first, and maybe that was what he was doing, as he was by now, in between me and this creature. But I could tell I was the last thing on his mind at this point. The dog barks a few more times, then he turns and runs straight past me and back up the farm track to safety. The way we came in. No doubt now you can imagine how stunned I was. The whole incident lasted only seconds and I just stood there, paralyzed, and trying to process what I had just seen. I must have been in shock because of what I did next I did without conscious thought, 
and I can't explain why I did it. But as I stood there looking at this creature, I nodded my head quickly, and I said, All right to it. I know that's crazy, but that's what I did. Then I just calmly turned around and started walking back down the field track after my dog, all the time listening for this creature coming behind me. I was completely shutting myself. I think I acted without thinking as I never looked back up that track until I got to the dog and I, I couldn't see anything in the field anymore when I did. I didn't report this for years and years until other people came forward in secret and started to share their accounts online with each other. I had no idea what a Bigfoot was back then. Now years on from seeing them online, I can say without doubt it looked like it was an exact match. I have spoken with this witness on numerous occasions, and I did get in touch this week to let him know another person had come forward from the same area. When I was in high school about 15 years ago, a group of friends and I were hanging out at our friend Dale's house. For some backstory, we lived way out in the country, also technically part of Appalachia, in the kind of middle of nowhere where the nearest neighbors are a few miles up the road. Dale happened to have a cave near his property that we liked to explore and be dumb teenagers in. To get to the cave, you had to walk roughly a mile through dense woods and cross a big field. We had yet to find the end of the cave system despite exploring for hours at a time, multiple times. One day, we had spent the better part of the afternoon exploring the caves, and it had gotten dark by the time we emerged. We already had flashlights, so that was no big deal. My memory is a little fuzzy on the exact details, but for some reason... Our friend Sam decided to go back to the house a little earlier. I want to say we had ordered pizza or something, and he went to meet the driver. The rest of us started making our way back through the woods to Dale's house when we started hearing voices in the woods. We were asking each other if we heard that and where it came from, but we each had a different direction of where we thought it was coming from. It was a childlike voice, and it sounded like talking or whispering, but you couldn't make out what was being said. At this point, we thought one of our friends was messing with us and started to talk back to it. It sounded like a child giggling, and then our flashlights started to flicker and die. We had one dim light left to get the rest of the way back. We were all thoroughly freaked out, prank or not, and hightailed it back to the house, adrenaline pumping. We all got in the house, shut the door, and I felt a sense of safety for a split second before the crucifix on the wall literally came off the wall and broke on the floor. It literally seems like something out of a bad horror movie, but we all watched it legitimately come off the wall and crash the, the ground with for no apparent reason. Before that moment, I hadn't been convinced it wasn't our other friend Sam that was messing with us, even though he really wasn't the type. We all started word vomiting at Sam trying to explain what had just happened and question if he had something to do with it, but he genuinely seemed freaked out and confused. He actually said that on his way back to the house earlier, he kept hearing weird things and seeing lights in the woods, and he thought it was us trying to play a prank on him. I don't know what it was, maybe our friend is a great actor, but I honestly don't think it was a prank. The feeling I got in the woods like every hair was standing on end. Goosebumps. On my goosebumps and every fiber of my being, screaming to run. I have never felt like that again and never want to. I'm a logger living in northwest Oregon. I've lived here my entire life. These woods are my home. My father and my grandfather were loggers, and I took over the family business after they retired. A private landowner liked how we conducted business, and we provided him light arborist work as well. Recently, he had some old trees that he wanted us to take down. It was an easy job. 
My buddy and I set to work and ended up cutting well into the night, so we decided to just make camp for the night and pick up first thing in the morning. That way it would be out of our hair and we could just keep it moving. I pitched a tent for us while my friend made the fire. We spent a few hours telling jokes and drinking until we decided to get some shut-eye. The tent ended up being a bit warm, so I decided to sleep out under the stars. It was a beautiful summer night, and the stars were always more visible out here in the woods. So eventually, the sound of the wind and the swaying of the trees lulled me to sleep. I woke up a few hours later. It was pitch dark. The stars weren't out anymore, and the wind was no longer blowing in the trees. Everything was very still. It felt like it happened in an instant, like a blink, and this stillness set in all at once. In the distance, I heard a strange noise. A loud, blood-curdling roar echoing through the forest. All my hair stood up on end as I reached for my flashlight. When I clicked it on, it was super bright. I beamed directly into the deep woods, and the roar happened again. And that's when the breeze picked up. I crawled over to the tent to kick it so my friend would wake up. I heard him rustling inside as he slowly unzipped the tent, and he's white as a sheet. I know just from his face that he had also heard the roar. We both know what bears sound like, and we know how to handle them. We were scared, but also curious. Only a very large creature could make a noise like this. I reckoned it was much bigger than a bear. Then in the next moment, a tree fell about a hundred or so yards from camp. It was a big old tree. It slammed into another tree, and it fell that one too. My friends looked at me deaded in the eyes, and slowly he raised his flashlight in the direction of the fallen tree. He turned it on. There it was. This creature was huge, much bigger than a bear. It was on all fours like a bear, and it had that similar giant head. But this creature had very sparse dark fur and lots of light-colored bear skin. I could see its muscles shifting, and whatever it was, it fell two trees like they were nothing. The creature roared once again and turned in our direction. It stared into the glare of our flashlight and, to our shock, started running at us. We glanced at each other and quickly climbed a nearby tree. Luckily, we got up there before the creature noticed where we went. We heard it tearing through the tent in the campsite for what seemed like hours. There we stayed until the sun rose and brightened the dark woods. We had no idea where the creature had gone. When we looked down our tent and our campsite, it was torn to shreds. It looked like a whole pack of bears descended on it, rather than just one large one. We slowly moved down the tree, watching around the area as we descended. We gathered whatever stuff we could salvage, then walked as quickly and quietly back to our truck as we could. I drove directly home. I don't know what it was, but it could have killed us and anyone else that got in its way. Looking back at the encounter, and after talking to my friend, we believe that it may have been what some people refer to as a dogman, the human. Like way it appeared was not only shocking, but totally confusing. I just don't have any other explanation as to what this creature was. This happened only a week ago. My girlfriend and I were visiting the Arches and Canyonlands area for the weekend and ended up heading out pretty late from Moab to get into Canyonlands. About 45 minutes, one hour drive. A few years previous, I'd gone there myself and stayed until the moon rose because that meant people were leaving and as a field recordist, that meant a quiet environment to record in. That night in 2020... The moon was bright, and there were a few night photographers there. I ended up hanging out with, and it was generally a surreal experience, and I felt completely safe. Hoping to have a similar time again with girlfriend along for the ride, and forgetting the fact that maybe the clouds would largely block moonlight that night, I drove us up. It was pretty dark before we even made it 15 minutes along the drive there. Having been there, more specifically, Mesa Arch, twice before, and this being a borderline spiritual place for me, I didn't even think about danger or anything of the sort. Despite that, 
I had a sixth sense type of gut feeling pretty early on that we shouldn't head up there that night. Not wanting to freak myself out or my girlfriend that I didn't say anything or think much of it and chalked it up to just being nervous because it was dark. There was a certain vibe along the roads leading up and we noticed there were people leaving the park but no one coming in ahead of or behind us. The instinct to not continue hit me subtly a few more times, and I kept pushing it away like an idiot. I've been very familiar with these instincts over the past years, and they've served me well as far as I can tell. I think I genuinely thought I was just scared because it was dark. We ended up at the Mesa Arch parking lot where two cars were packing up and heading out. When they left, it was almost completely dark, with only the faintest glow of moon through the clouds, and not a person around anywhere near us. Canyonlands is pretty remote. We get our backpacks on, grab a couple things, and my girlfriend makes sure I've got my CCW. She doesn't usually care much, so this struck me as indication she was maybe concerned, too. We start heading up. It's a pretty short trail, maybe one quarter mile. All we wanted to do was get to this little bowl-like area, the main destination, and hang out and record some sounds. The area is pretty open, with trees both live and dead scattered around, bushes and small cacti and rocky slopes that can be climbed in a few seconds. It's a pretty dope scene in daytime. I've never felt uneasy here previously. We'd been doing a bit of a travel vlog so far, so I continued doing that. I genuinely get goosebumps and chills every single time I think about this part. It was the weirdest feeling I've never felt. I felt instinctual I should get out of here. I'm being watched, etc. Type of feelings before and have several stories to tell from those. But I've never felt what I felt while vlogging. This might not seem relevant, but for context, the field recording I do is largely of gathering wood and rock sounds. Canyonlands has Navajo sandstone and juniper wood, both of which sound wonderful when tumbled and rolled around. I think of field recording as an art, yes, but also as a way to appreciate a land in a closer way, at least for me than just taking pictures of it. I feel like I'm capturing the essence of a location in a very respectful way. As I'm vlogging, I felt something I can only describe as a need to show that I was there peacefully and with respectful intent. I didn't hear anything or see anything. That would indicate that I needed to show I was here on peaceful business, but I felt it so strongly. Again, I didn't want to scare my girlfriend, so I didn't say this. I figured I was just feeling on edge being in near complete darkness. We could barely see our own feet on the easy open trail. We'd kept our lamps off to let our eyes adjust to the glow, but I turned mine on to read a plaque. My girlfriend mentioned I should probably turn it off so I don't create shadows and freak us out, so I turned it back off. I also felt like I was spotlighting myself by having it on, and I was about to turn it back off before she said that. We continued and the uneasiness only grew. This lasted until we both reached the same exact spot on the trail and stopped at the same time in silence. I think we should go back, my girlfriend said, and I agreed. Never have I felt a stronger feeling of being unwelcome in a place. It felt like we hit a barrier. Not only did I feel unwelcome, it was more particularly the feeling of intruding on a congregation or meeting or gathering that we were not invited to. I don't know how to describe this feeling at all besides that, and it was not a conscious thought. It was just there, as these kinds of instincts tend to be. At that point, I realized I'd been ignoring these feelings long enough, and it was most certainly time to go. I have no idea what was going on in that little bowl we were about to reach, but I didn't want to find out. We made our way quickly back to the car. As soon as we get back, we hear a large pack of coyotes quite nearby, but in the opposite direction we'd been heading on the trail, if we'd continued on that trail. It was not coyotes we would run into. Still, this felt like an additional cue to leave, and my girlfriend said, that's our cue. 
I badly wanted to record their yips, but common sense took over and we got the hell out of there. The road, completely devoid of any sign of other people, was particularly eerie. Driving back wasn't just trying to get back to our campsite in Moab. It felt like we were escaping, like when you turn off the lights and run up the stairs. Now relatively safe in our car, we discussed what has just happened. Every single unspoken, strong gut feeling I'd had, my girlfriend had felt. The exact same things at the same times. Both felt the need to show something, see? Someone that we meant no harm by vlogging and being chill outwardly. Both felt multiple times, both on the drive there and on the trail, that we shouldn't go. Both felt at the same times that we were like actors on a stage being watched by a multitude of something. Both felt unwelcome, like we were crashing a party. Both felt that we needed to go at the same exact point on the trail. None of these were spoken aloud to each other at any point until we were back on the road. Get the F outing. As we drove, the moon became visible for a bit. I'm not familiar with moon stuff, but it had been a full moon a few days before, and that night it was large, not full though, and red. This was because of the red sand in the air from the windy day we'd had. I think, but my girlfriend said that also meant bad juju. Looking into the history of the region, and even stories of strange happenings at T. Massa Arch, I am sure we avoided something strange and or, or dangerous. I wanted to share this story here. Sometimes the places you love can still get spooky things going on when you're there at the wrong time. Hi everyone! Haven't posted here since my weird little hike whilst in my holes last year in New England where I got freaked in New Hampshire. Anyway, just again for background, I am basically a true Londoner, lived west for 25 years, but before that lived in a small village in Buckinghamshire, UK, where I could basically write a book about the weirdness that happened in the countryside there throughout my childhood. The United Kingdom has some very spiritual, ancient, and pagan sites scattered basically everywhere. Anyway, this latest backwoods creep of mine didn't actually happen in the wilds, but actually on the doorstep of London. I will set the scene. I go walking or hiking at every opportunity I get, even though I live in the city, but I still find interesting walks wherever I can, in London or further afield. One of my faves is a little 12k trek from Rickmansworth in Bucks to Uxbridge, a London suburb, along the canal. Even though it's busy at either end of the hike, it gets very desolate and quiet when it travels through the Coon Valley Regional Park, and I have never seen anyone within about a six trek every time I do the walk. Just to let everyone know, I do believe in the sinister elements of the countryside, such as Pan, etc., so... Anyway, each time I have done this walk, I get to a spot where I, I just basically feel scared and uncomfortable, but can't put my finger on it. Each time I have heard a very weird hollow knocking, despite there being just fields on either side. Last time was the worst, though. I entered the area knowing I would feel apprehensive for a good one to 2K and would hear the knocking, but this was different. I got totally overwhelmed with pure panic. I literally could hear someone or something walking in the undergrowth parallel to me, to the point I stopped and ventured into the hedges to look. Of course, nothing there. I started walking again and again, could hear footsteps parallel to mine. I ended up getting a totally panicked and ended up in tears as I was so scared. It only stopped when I came across a few narrow boats moored on the canal. Again, I can't stress enough that this stretch of canal is absolutely full of fear and dread. And I can't explain. I do think it's pan and the primeval fear that can surround a person as an aside. Even though the UK is tiny, we have amazing countryside and legends that surround it. 
It's a great place to hike. A few years ago, my mom and I were driving home around 3 a.m. As we turned onto my street, I was looking out the window and noticed the back of a super tall, lanky, whitish, gray, hairless figure walking between two houses and about to disappear behind them. I distinctly remember seeing its spine because it was hunched over and incredibly skinny. Although I was initially freaked out, I considered the late hour and thought I might have been seeing things. I stayed quiet and my mom continued driving. A moment later, my mom turned to me and exclaimed, What the heck was that? My heart sank as she had seen it too. According to her, when we turned onto the block, her high beams illuminated it. Its eyes glared like an animal's when the light hit it, revealing big, sharpish teeth as it grimaced angrily at us before turning and walking away. She described the same body and walking manner as me, and mentioned that it turned away from us and disappeared behind the houses. We were both terrified and unsure of what we had witnessed. My mom also mentioned that earlier, on her way to pick me up, she had seen several deer, but on her way back when we saw the mysterious figure, there were no deer in sight. I live in a suburban part of New Jersey with woods around, and this experience has left us frightened. My mom, in particular, has never been scared like this before, especially considering that she saw its face. Does anyone have any idea what we might have seen? Let me preface this with the fact my family has been in the Ozarks of Missouri or Arkansas since before the Civil War. It is a weird and wonderful place with a lot of characters living in it. We're very rarely scared running through these woods, but it is probably due to the fact we know the weird woods and the oddballs who live in it. Our version of Missing 411 is some yahoo getting too drunk on green whiskey and passing out under a tree for a day after leaving the bootleg still set up in a cave. Yes, an elderly woman was arrested a couple of years ago for running a moonshine operation. Meth changed a lot of people here, but even if you run into somebody cooking it in the woods, wet weather creek beds and mountain dew are their favorite. Just greet them and continue on your way because they'll be gone in half a day. In the early 80s, my brother Steve, age 16, went to northern Missouri, flatland, with his best friend, Mike, to visit his relatives who were farmers. We grew up to be rather independent. Driving a car by age 12 was the status quo among country kids. So aside from being required to go to church, we were pretty much allowed to do what we wanted, and it sounds like it was no different for them there. They had a lot of fun goofing around and had great stories of what they did, but one story sticks out in my mind. Late one night, they were in my brother's old hot rod Mustang driving down the long, straight, and narrow dirt roads of farm country. We live in the Rocky Hills, when the road became a very tight one lane with a fence line. So overgrown with trees, they were a canopy over the road. It can be odd to see overgrown roads in that area because fertile flat land is a precious commodity. He said they were creeping along because they didn't want to run into a dead end with a fence and tear the car up. Headlights were definitely not the same as now. And something just seemed funky. Along the lane, they passed a drive with a chained-up wire hog panel as a gate. In the moonlight, they could see an old two-story farmhouse that had collapsed in on itself with a traditional big barn beside it, looking like it was going to do the same at any time. There wasn't a pole light that most people keep around, only the moonlight. They continued on as the road seemed to get even more overgrown, talking about whether they should just attempt to back up the half mile to the farm's driveway and turn around. Finally, they could see ahead that the road opened up to some sort of a clearing, and as they pulled into it, the road suddenly ended at an old iron gate with a makeshift sign reading Coon Cemetery. They were at a graveyard. By this time, they had spooked themselves out. 
They were somewhat lost, and had just creeped down some overgrown road to end up at a graveyard in the middle of the night. Steve managed to turn the car around and head back, going a little more quickly than before. As they started nearing the driveway to the run-down farm, they could just make out something very tall and glowing white in the driveway of the old place. As the headlights hit the drive and the apparition, they realized it was a ghostly white, giant old man, around six foot four, standing by the side of the road, wearing only pants and no shoes, just calmly waving at them, still nary a light but the moon. They hightailed it out of there, and they both could have cared less if he scratched his car or not. He told us that over thirty years ago, and I have never forgotten it. Lol. When I worked at a camp in Colorado, we used to do astronomy nights. It would get really dark because the location was pretty remote. One night, when a couple of the other interns and I were setting up for stargazing, we heard a noise that sounded like a human making a funny cat sound. We thought it was our boss because it was right by his cabin. But no matter how much we yelled back, thinking he was messing with us, it continued the exact same way. The next week, we saw something running back and forth and crouching behind some cars parked in a field. It looked like an incredibly tall man. Aside from that, we'd smell funky smells randomly all over campus. Weird stuff would happen all the time. Kids would act sue you for weird in the middle of the night. And interns would hear weird animal sounds outside the windows that didn't really sound like. Animals? Thoughts? Edit. For context, this was a closed campus in an incredibly rural town. The man running couldn't have been someone from our camp everyone was accounted for, and it couldn't have been an outsider unless they had walked miles and jumped many electric property line fences. When the figure was running, it almost looked like something on it was shiny, like its eyes or something. When we saw a tiny flashing gleam is when we first noticed that something was moving, then we saw the figure. Kids would also run up to me on the way down the path to stargazing, saying they saw someone or something running through the trees. I grew up in north-central Wisconsin. After high school, I served ten years in the U.S. Marine Corps. I retired from the military after twenty-three years and worked as a hydraulics mechanic in a plant that made body armor for the military. Now to the weird stuff. My little brother owns about fourteen acres of woods with his house a few miles west of Frankfort, Kentucky. Two years ago, I started a deer hunt out there. The woods of three hills with two drains breaking them up. They were in an L shape, draining into a creek bottom. In the first year, the 2018 season, I positioned myself in the middle of the hill and had a good view down to a clearing about 50 yards away with a bunch of failed trees and limbs. I spent most of three weeks looking down into the clearing. Nothing unusual happened this year, but it's important. Back in 2019, about five months before deer season opened up, I ended up buying a tree stand. We put it together and set it up at the bottom of the hills by the creek with my back to the property line. Depending on the wind, I would either use the tree or sit at the top of my original spot. One day in the tree stand after I woke up, I noticed that it was dead quiet. No birds, no squirrels, nothing. Just silence. I didn't see anything. It just felt weird. After about 20 minutes, the woods went back to normal. A couple of days later, the wind changed directions. So I was sitting at the top of the hill in my old spot, looking down into that clearing. I'm not seeing anything all day. I decided to check the trail across the clearing for fresh deer signs. I slowly made my way down the hill to the edge of the clearing. Now this is the same clearing I spent all the previous season looking down into then off and on this current season. When I got down to the bottom, a panic started to come over me. Somehow I felt lost. I was turning around, looking all over, trying to figure out where I was and how to get out. I didn't have any idea where I was. 
I managed to calm myself down and focused on a big oak tree, and suddenly I knew exactly where I was at. I started walking back up the hill to my spot in front of the tree where I had my gear. I was trying to make sense of what just happened. I grabbed my gear, got in the truck, and went to my brother's house. I told him what had just happened. He actually believed me. I was back out there at four the next morning and didn't have any other occurrences. In 1978, in north-central Wisconsin, during my senior year in high school, we had two pet rabbits. In the evenings, I would ride my motorcycle out into the country to this clover field to pick some for the rabbits. One evening, I was picking clover and looked over my shoulder and saw this dark figure of what I thought was a bear. It was about 150 yards away eating the clover. As I watched it, the damn thing stood up and looked over at me. It then turned and walked into the tree line. This sort of freaked me out at the time. I never heard anything about Sasquatch, so I didn't know what it was until many years later. And yes, I would still go back there to pick clover, but I kept my bike running and pointed towards home. I live in eastern Washington, and I'm a 27-year firefighter or paramedic veteran. I volunteer with several search and rescue teams from Washington to Idaho. In the late spring of 2014, I was on vacation at my son and daughter-in-law's home in northern Idaho when over the local news they announced a need for trained rescue members to help search for a family of five lost for two days. I travel with my seasonal rescue equipment, so I'm prepared at all times. I drove an hour and 45 minutes with my son to a northern Idaho town out of Bonner's Ferry where the command center was. We divided into teams of seven. Everyone from all over the north came out to help. I took the lead of my team and searched the high country at the border of Montana and Idaho. When we arrived, we met a Montana conservation officer. He told us that the father and children had made it out, but he had to leave his wife because her hip seemed to be broken and she couldn't walk. He had left a 357 pistol with her for protection and signal for rescuers. She also had a whistle. As we headed up the mountain after one hour, we ran into three search volunteers that were gassed from the off-trail search. As they followed the sound of a whistle, they said that, they followed the whistle sound into the big timber, but couldn't catch up to it. Confused by this report, we marked their last GPS area on our map and proceeded to that area. It was four in the afternoon. Weather was sunny and dry. We heard a faint whistle sound come from a ridge roughly a half mile ahead. We thought, awesome, we found her. This is when things went weird. We hiked maybe 1,000 feet when we heard the whistle again. This time it was closer. We yelled out to her, but with no reply. We walked another 500 feet when this time the whistle was now blowing constantly, always ahead of us. Our trail was coming to an end. It turned into a narrow game trail. I pulled up the map in GPS to check where we were. We were in the correct area, but it did not match the husband's description. We all talked it over. This time, out of the seven of us, four voted to continue to follow this now loud blowing and constant whistle. Through the timber, across the creek's upper rock wall to a meadow, we found her. I radioed to command. We have her. Send the helicopter. She is unconscious. As I said, an IV and the other medic stabilized her pelvis. The others cleared out the brush and branches so the prop wash from the airlift wouldn't hurt anyone. One of the members walked over and handed me a bright orange whistle on a lanyard that she said she found hanging on. A tree limb, 35 yards away. That freaked us out. How the hell did she blow that whistle? She was unconscious. There were no other hikers on the mountain that we saw, and the area where the whistle was hanging was above a cliff just yards away. After she was recovered by life flight helicopter, we headed out to the command center. The sheriff greeted us. He took us aside and asked all of us if we saw anything strange. Apparently, when the helicopter was approaching, they both saw a large creature walking away from where we were. We told them about the traveling whistle and how it kept moving as we followed, and that's how we found the victim. 
Now, I've heard stories of people being helped by these creatures, or Bigfoot, as you call them. There are nine of us, a sheriff, two firefighters, myself, and others who experience this wonder. I grew up in the Pacific Northwest and was an avid hiker. In 2013, a group of friends invited me to go mushroom hunting in the Siuslaw National Forest, about an hour outside of Portland, where we live. We spent significant time in the coastal forest, but mushrooms tended to cluster in areas with lighter foliage cover. Our de facto expert had experienced foraging off of old logging roads and suggested a spot he visited the year prior. We drove to the end of a one-lane dirt road overlooking a deep ravine. Each of us put on our gear and bushwhacked through the comparatively sparse undergrowth, checking the leaves and debris for fun guy. After about 20 minutes, I came across a small clearing of trees, perhaps a one-time campsite for loggers. About halfway across the spans, I noticed something pink on the ground ahead. What I saw stopped me dead in my tracks. Resting on the leaves was the heart of an unknown animal, roughly the size of my fist, still untouched by the elements and fauna. There was no trace of a body in the immediate area, no other organs, remnants of flesh, or visible blood. It was spotless. The heart had no bite marks, and the tissue was still dark red. I ran like hell back to the car. Mercifully, my friend decided to hang back. We rounded everyone up and left immediately. I have a photograph of the heart, although wish I'd taken one of the clearing. Please let me know if you have any explanations for this. It happened around the Mutt, Hebo area. For a little backstory, I travel frequently. I live a one-suitcase lifestyle, traveling with the wind for the most part. As I go, I pick up odd jobs and such to make money to get by. As a teenager, I was inspired by Chris McCandless, and I have tried to make my life like his, except keeping in touch with friends and family along the way. I've seen many beautiful parks and such, and I really can't complain about my life. Things were normal until I met Rick, that is. He's a park ranger, a park I won't mention for my safety and your own and our connection was instant. He was knowledgeable about the park, witty, and quite drop-dead gorgeous, if I'm being honest. We hit it off right away, and within the day of meeting, we were going out for dinner. We talked for hours, and the next day, we met up for a hike. I'm usually wary of strangers, but he was a ranger, so I trusted him. He showed me some beautiful valleys in the park, and told some incredible stories about the wildlife along the way. Then he asked me to come back to his cabin. As a woman, this was a red flag. As nice as he was, and as connected as I felt we were, it's still a little unnerving to think about going to a practically stranger's cabin, alone, when no one knows where you are. But I pushed my fear down and agreed to join him for dinner at his place after his shift. I met him at the ranger station, and we drove in his pickup to his cabin. It was set back in the woods about five minutes outside of park property. On the way, he gave me a rundown of the house's history. Passed down for generations, it had been standing in the same place for over 200 years. His parents had used it as a summer house while he was growing up, but had gifted it to him when they decided to move to the West Coast. He had lived here for five years, and that's why he got a job as a park ranger. When we pulled down the long drive, you could tell the place had history. Calling this place a cabin feels like an understatement. This cabin was massive. A mansion would be a better word for it. It was grand and beautiful. It did resemble a cabin, just at a larger scale. The yard was huge, with the house set in the middle of the property. The edge of the woods surrounding the property gave me the creeps, if I'm being honest. It was almost dusk, and the woods weren't inviting. They looked scary, like they would twist and change when you turn your back. Rick turned to me once we'd stepped into the entryway of his house. What do you think? He smiled. It's beautiful, I said, staring at the tall ceilings and the giant staircase to my right. I love it. 
He grabbed my hand and led me to the kitchen. The house really was beautiful inside. The only part I didn't like was the paintings on the wall. They followed you with their eyes, and it sent a chill down my spine. Rick must have noticed me eyeing the paintings, because he then said that's everyone who's ever lived in this house. It's a tradition to have them painted and hung on the wall. I adore them, but they creep me out a little. He chuckled and then pointed at one of the frames. There's me at the ripe old age of 16. His smile in the photo was the same as it was the day I met him. Big and inviting. Maybe it was the imperfect teeth or the way his dimples shined from his cheeks. But he looked so happy. The painting was gorgeously done. You could tell whoever painted it took lots of effort with the details. He looks like he hasn't aged a day, minus the deeper bags under his eyes, in the five o'clock shadow that he had now. Maybe it's because I know him, but even to this day, his painting is the only one that doesn't give me the creeps. After a few minutes of introducing me to his family in the paintings, we continued into the kitchen. It was just as put together as the rest of the house. But you could tell the utensils and such had been around for a while. The kitchen aid mixer looked like it was from the 60s, if not older. If anything, the age of everything just gave it more charm. The fridge was also from the 60s, and it was quite cute. Everything in the kitchen was nice, and the lack of paintings and their suspecting gaze helped me to calm down. To skip a little bit of the lengthy, unnecessary details, I moved in with him about a week later. Very soon, I know, but I felt like I'd known him forever, and the park that he worked at was beautiful and massive. So much to see. I felt like I needed to stick around. Rick helped me to get a job at a watchtower in the park, and I was making good money, too. About six months later, I found out I was pregnant. Three months along. I wasn't really ready for a kid, but I was excited. Rick was stoked also, more than me, honestly. He's been a great dad, but he was nervous. After a lot of discussion, I agreed that I would take a leave from work to stay home until after the baby was born just in case an actual emergency were to happen while I was on duty. I'd been off for about two weeks now, and it was easy going. I took care of the yard work at our house and ventured into the surrounding woods, although not very far. Something still seemed off about them. I found ways to keep myself entertained, and it's not so bad. And Rick felt better knowing that the baby and I were safe on the property. That was until the third week of being off work. It was bright and early on a Tuesday morning, although the forecast was calling for rain this afternoon. I figured I'd go out and weed the garden I had started, and then maybe do some light cleaning inside. I spent most of the morning weeding, and around noon I went inside to get something to drink. I was sitting at the counter drinking some water when I heard it, a faint yell. It caught my attention, but after not hearing anything else, I let it go shuffling through the stack of mail I had brought in earlier. There was a letter from my sister, and I was about to grab a letter opener when I heard it again. A yell louder this time coming from outside, and another one this time I could make out the words. My baby. Oh no, my baby. Please help me. Even though I hadn't been pregnant for more than four months, my maternal instinct kicked in. A fellow mother was having trouble with her baby, and I needed a help. I pushed down the logical questions that I should have had. Like, why was this lady on our property set deep into the woods? Or what could possibly be wrong with her baby that she hadn't taken it to the hospital and gotten help? I did make one choice before I went outside, that to this day I'm still grateful for. I grabbed my phone and car keys before going outside. Maybe it was the thought of needing to take this lady to the hospital, or the deep-down instinct of needing to flee in the face of danger. But nonetheless, they were safely tucked in my pocket. When I stepped out onto the front porch, I saw her, walking from the tree line, actually scratch that limping, in a way that was so grotesque it made my stomach flip. Something was wrong with this woman, and it was quite obvious. She continued howling, my biabi abi as she limped her way closer to the house. The way she moved is something I will never forget. It was scary and gross. 
Her arms were wrapped by her chest, cradling a bundle of what I could only assume to be her baby. When she stepped forward, she drug her leg behind her. With every step, her body swayed down and then back up again, almost as if her legs were two different lengths. She moved slowly and kept her head down. Since she was still pretty far off, I couldn't really see her face, but I could see that her hair was tangled and falling down over her face, and that her head hung far to one side. Her clothes looked old, almost like she had just stepped out of the early 1900s. She looked gross and injured, to say the least. Realizing that I was just standing there when someone clearly in distress was right in front of me, I walked briskly down the stairs. Ma'am, ma'am, what's wrong? Can I help you? Where's your baby? When she heard my voice, she looked up. The sight of her made me gag. She was terrifying. Her face was covered in dirt and scratches. Her neck was badly bruised, and her eyes, something I'll never get out of my head. They were just like the paintings in the hall, burning a hole right in you and never looking away. She looked at me, and then it was like she changed. She went from the prey to the predator. The bundle in her arms hit the ground in an instant, with no regard for what I'd assumed to be the baby. She took off running, if that's what you could call it, never taking her eyes off of me. She came charging right towards me, hobbling at high speeds, making this disgusting, gurgling sound. You have my baby, she screamed at me, still charging at me from the edge of the tree land. I was so caught off guard that I just stood there. Then all at once it hit me that I needed to get the F out of there ASAP. I dove my hand into my pocket and grabbed my keys, taking off towards my car. It was like the woman creature picked up speed. She was about the same distance from me that I was from my car. I ran faster than I ever had. Glad that I left my car unlocked, I ripped the door open, dove into the driver's seat, and slammed the door, smashing down repeatedly on the lock button. I shut the door just in time. The woman reached my car and began banging on my window. My eyes never left hers as my hand slid the key into the ignition and turned. The car roared to life. I threw it into drive and slammed on the gas, tearing up the gravel as I sped down the driveway. And every time I shut my eyes, I could see the woman's eyes. They were bright yellow, such an unnatural color for eyes. Her facial features were gaunt, and she seemed lifeless. Once I reached the end of my driveway, I glanced in the rearview mirror. She stood about halfway down the drive, with her head hung at that unnatural angle. I couldn't really make out her face, but I could feel her eyes staring right at me. I punched on the gas and took off, going to the only place I could think of, the park. Once I reached the ranger station, I parked my car and sprinted into the building. When I got inside, one of the rangers named Stacy was sitting at a desk. Jesus, Nettie, you look like you've seen a ghost. She jumped up from her chair and walked over to me, pulling me into a hug. What's wrong, sweetie? There was a, a woman at my house. She tried to attack me, I think. I don't know. I got in my car before she could get to me, I said, pulling away from the hug. I just now realized I was crying. I'm calling Rick back from patrol. You need to sit down. Stacia pulled me over to a chair, and she walked over to the phone. After talking briefly to Rick on the phone, she came back and sat down across from me. Start from the beginning. What happened? I told the story in full, starting from when I went inside to get a glass of water. I felt crazy retelling it. It just sounded ridiculous. But there was no denying it had happened. Is that how your window got cracked? Stacy, I gestured out the window. My car window was indeed cracked, pretty much shattered. I have no idea how I didn't notice it earlier. Must have been because of the adrenaline or something. I know I sound crazy, but I swear I'm not making any of this up. She looked into my eyes and I could see the sympathy. Listen, girlfriend, I totally believe you. I work at a national park and I've seen some shit that I couldn't logically explain. I know one thing for sure. You're not going back to that house tonight. Definitely not alone. We waited for Rick to get to the station. Stacy had told me about a date she had been on recently. 
The date story was boring, but I'll be forever grateful that she told it to me because it gave me a few moments of distraction from the sheer terror I was feeling. I had made up my mind right then and there that I wouldn't be going back to that house, not while that woman-like thing was still on the prowl, especially not if she wanted my baby, the baby that was four months old, nowhere near ready to be born, and never ready to be snatched by some foul creature from the 1900s. It seemed like an eternity, but Rick finally showed up. He burst through the door and pulled me up into a hug. What the F happened? He pulled back and looked into my eyes. I'm sure he could see the terror. I'd been calm while Stacy I was telling me her story. But after finally seeing Rick, the anxiety and fear was back. I told the story again from beginning to end while Rick paced back and forth across the station. When I finished the story, Rick simply said, come with me. I stood up and walked after him, out the door. I glanced back at Stacy I, and she gave me a look of sympathy, but she nodded for me to follow. Rick got into his truck, and I got in the passenger seat. He sighed loudly. We have to go back to the house. I'm sorry, but what the F do you mean we have to go back to that house? I'm not going back there. You can't make me. Did you hear a word I said? I'm not. Stop. Rick turned to look at me. I'm not going to lie. I was fuming. I was not going back to that house. Not after what I'd seen. Not after what had happened. Not today. And honestly, not ever. We have to go back. I know you don't want to, and I know I sound crazy, but we have to. I'm sorry, I was really hoping this wouldn't happen while you were here, but since it did, we have to do something about it. He put his hand on mine for a moment, and then pulled away, turning the key in the ignition. Are you going to at least tell me what happened, who that lady was, and why this happened in the first place? Yes, but you need to listen, and you've got to believe me. It sounds crazy, but after what you've seen, I'm sure believing me won't be a problem. I nodded, not sure what to say. The day you met Laura, she lived in the house from 1892 to 1917. She was an out of man, obviously one that goes back a ways. I don't remember how many greats she was. Anyway, in 1917, she got pregnant with her first child. She was an old mother for her time. Even though 25 is nothing nowadays, when? She finally gave birth, the baby was stillborn. Since there wasn't much for medical things back then, they didn't know that the baby was dead until the day it was born. Laura was overcome with grief from the death of her baby. She carried around its poor corpse for days until it began to stink, and her brother, my something great-grandfather, had to take it from her and bury it in the family cemetery. After taking her baby away, Laura completely lost it. One of her sister-in-laws was pregnant at the time, and Laura went after her. She tried to claw the baby right out of her, the whole time screaming about her baby. My grandpa and uncle were able to break them up, but something had to be done about Laura. They planned on taking her to a hospital for the insane, but they locked her in her bedroom that night, not knowing it was the last time they'd see her alive. She hung herself from the rafters that night, breaking her neck. She's haunted the place ever since. I've only seen her once, shortly after my brother was born, and I never wanted to see her again. But I've heard her story many times. He looked over at me. I was in shock. I believed him. I mean, I'd seen this lady, and her neck was definitely broken, but still. The story did sound pretty crazy, and this was a lot to take in. I mean, I'd seen weird shit working in the watchtower and throughout my travels, but nothing quite that far out in left field. I just nodded in response to Rick's words, and that seemed to be enough for him. He put the truck in drive and began the trip to our house. After a few minutes, I spoke. Ricky, what are we going to do when we get there? Is Laura gone? Listen carefully. We can get rid of her for now, but we have to do this right the first time. He looked at me. Do you understand? Yes. Good. All right. When we get to the house, she'll be sitting on the porch, on the rocking chair to the far left. She'll have her little bundle in her arms again, and she'll be calm. She'll be fine until she notices you're there. 
Then she'll get up and begin to approach you again. I know it's scary, but I'll be right with you the whole time, I promise. When she notices you, you need to speak these words. Say them loud and clear so she hears you. Laura, your baby lies not with me, but in the clearing over the hill, in a little basket under the ground waiting for you. Do you hear his cries? He needs you. It'll be obvious if she's heard you, and then she'll retreat into the woods to the cemetery where her baby is. Rick looked back at me. Got all that? Yeah, I think so. Laura, your baby lies not with me, but in the clearing over the hill, in a little basket under the ground waiting for you. Do you hear his cries? He needs you. I recited word for word, ready to do whatever it takes to get that ghost away from our house. Sounds good. You're as ready as you'll ever be, as I guess. He kept his eyes on the road. We were almost to the turn for our driveway. How do you know this will work? What do we do if it doesn't? I didn't mean to come across as panicky, but can you blame me? I've never dealt with ghosts before, especially not ones trying to steal my unborn child. It's gonna work, but if it doesn't, just get back in the truck and we'll leave. But it's gonna work. I promise you that, darling. He grabbed my hand. Everything's gonna be just fine. But how do you know? I wanted to believe him. I really did. But it all just sounded so silly. Because my mom did it when I was younger. I've heard plenty of stories. My family has been doing this since Laura passed. There's no way to get rid of her, just ways to keep her at bay. He squeezed my hand. Just like that. We were pulling down the long gravel driveway. I could see Laura rocking back and forth on our porch, staring down over that little bundle of blankets. We parked a few yards away from the porch, and we both stepped out of the truck, leaving the doors open. Rick whispered to me, I'll get her attention, but the second she looks at you, you need to start talking immediately. I nodded in response. The phrase was on repeat in my head. I was so afraid I'd forget something and mess everything up. I couldn't risk that. Rick whistled, just a small little tune, one that I'd heard him whistle many times before as he walked around the house. Laura looked up from the bundle and Rick nodded. I felt her eyes hit me and I began. Laura, your baby lies not with me, but in the clearing over the hill. At this point, she was at the bottom of the stairs. Her head hung to the side and her nasty yellow eyes burning holes in me. In a little basket under the ground waiting for you. She was maybe 15 feet away, her pace getting faster and faster, coming right towards me. Do you hear his cries? Ten feet he needs you? The second the you left my mouth, she stopped dead in her tracks. Thank God for that, because at that point she was a mere three feet away, and that was way to close for comfort. Suddenly her head whipped to the other side, and she seemed to morph right in front of my eyes. Her legs seemed to even out. Her clothes went from looking tattered and old to brand new, and her eyes turned into a stunning blue, seemingly identical to Rick's eyes. Then her neck snapped straight, like a normal person's neck would be. The worst part by far was when she opened her mouth and spoke. Her voice was hoarse at first, but then after a few words it sounded normal and quite pretty. She had a sing-song tone to the way she spoke. I hear him. I do. Pardon me, but I must tend to my babe. Thank you. And with that she turned around and walked back towards the tree line. Her stride was normal now, no longer limpy and painful. We stood hand in hand until she disappeared into the trees. I was a lot more at peace than I thought I would be, if I'm being honest. Maybe it was because Laura was just grieving and not actually evil, or maybe it's just because the whole experience seemed surreal. Either way, I was calm. We shut the truck doors and headed into the house. When we got inside, the first thing my eyes did was drift to the hallway with the paintings. I found Laura fairly quickly. She was beautiful, not nearly as frightening as she had been that afternoon. In fact, she mostly resembled the lady who had just returned to the woods a mere five minutes ago. The rest of the painting still felt like they looked directly at me, but her eyes seemed softened. They didn't feel like they burned into me anymore, thank goodness. 
I went to bed shortly after that, but there uh, was one more thing Rick told me about Laura that I feel like I should mention. Apparently, Laura only appears once per child, so I'll never see her again unless I have another baby. Luckily, she doesn't appear for children who don't live on the premises. That's good, because I wasn't looking forward to explaining to any future guests why there was a strange lady sprinting her way across the lawn. Well, that's all for this story, but trust me, I have many more. Some about my time working at the Watchtower, some about touring through the park, and a good deal of them about other things that happen at the house. Hunter and outdoorsman all of my life. The one thing that makes me want to give it all up is how we hunters act towards each other online. Grown men bashing the legal harvests of another young hunter, fellow hunters arguing over successful methods and tactics, and just the overall angst towards other hunters in general. It's sickening. Our sport seems to be dying, and hunters arguing with other hunters will never benefit the future of the sport. I'm not a hunter anymore. Something had been tearing Culver's cows clean open. Just a long slash, uttered a throat. Anything that wasn't eaten was spilled out onto the pasture. He reckoned wolves, and I was inclined to agree. I never saw anything quite like it in all my years of hunting. But what else but a wolf could do that to a cow? He hired me to see about it, and frankly, I was happy for any job. Wolves can be a challenge, even for someone like me. They're sly, for one. You can be standing right next to a wolf and never know it. You also have to be careful not to alert Big Brother about what you're up to. They let those bastards loose all over the place. Then act like a man's in the wrong for protecting his own livelihood. That's why I like to take an infrared camera with me when I hunt down wolves. Yeah, it's cheating a little, I know. But a fella needs to be aware of all that's around him in cases like that no matter if they walk on two legs or four. It was dawn when I set out from Culver's pasture, armed with a sufficiently powered rifle and the infrared camera hanging around my neck. A frost had settled in, which had the contradictory effect of dampening the sounds of the forest and amplifying my footsteps on the leaves. I felt a chill run through me and blamed it on the cold. I knew these woods well enough that the quiet didn't bother me, but something about that morning had me feeling on edge. Maybe it was the shape those cows had been in. Maybe it was the lack of bird song. Probably it was the most recent news about this place. Some college kid from the city hopped up on who knows what had stabbed his buddy to death on a camping trip. When they found him, he just kept screaming that he'd killed a monster. Not that I believed in monsters, mind you. It's the people you have to worry about. Crazies of all stripes in the world. Believe you me. I'd been out in the woods maybe an hour when I saw the first deer. It was a doe laid out on her side and ripped wide open. I raised my infrared camera and scanned the area for any heat signatures. Nothing. I was about to move on from the doe when it occurred to me that something was wrong. Even though she had obviously been killed by a predator, she hadn't been eaten. The tear down her belly was clean, and she was otherwise completely intact. There were not even any signs of scavengers or carrion birds. A shiver ran down my spine, and I unconsciously touched my gun. Maybe the wolf had been spooked and abandoned its kill, I thought. But that didn't quite explain the complete lack of predation. I licked my lips and looked around again. The eerie quiet still lingered in the forest. Not even the rustle of squirrels darting in the underbrush disrupted the stillness. All I could hear was my own breathing. The forest is only quiet if you don't know what you're listening for, I reminded myself. I strained to hear, but it was truly silent. I swallowed hard but kept walking, pulling my infrared camera to my eyes every few minutes. It wasn't long before I came to the next deer, a button buck in the same condition as the doe before him. This one had a significant difference, though. He was still steaming. A twig snapped behind me, and I twirled round, gun at the ready. 
I could see something in the underbrush, even though it was standing still. The rise and fall of its chest gave it away. It wasn't a wolf, that much I knew. I crept toward it, pausing at each footfall. Through the tangle of trees, I could make out its shape. It was tall. That was my first thought. Where I originally thought it had been standing upright, I could now see that it was crouched down on two legs, with long arms outstretched to either side, holding it steady. I raised my gun to my shoulder and peered through my sight. With the renewed focus the sight provided, the rest became clear. The thing was a monster, a nightmare from my childhood made real. Long curved claws stained red and brown emerged from human-like hands. Beady black eyes stared out from a furry, featureless face. Shaggy hair hung in lank waves over a thick, muscular body. I swallowed and steadied myself. I pulled the trigger and let out a breath of relief as the creature jerked back at the shoulder. It screamed a terrible high-pitched wail that sounded nearly human in its agony and shot back into the woods. It moved quickly through the trees, whatever it was, just a flash of a gray-brown pelt and a glimpse of long limbs. Every instinct I had told me to get out of the woods, to run away and never come back. But how could I face myself the next day, knowing that I'd injured a monster and left it to stalk these woods? How could I give in to my cowardice? I couldn't. I took a few deep breaths and walked over to where my bullet had ripped through the thing's shoulder. Blood splattered the brown leaves at my feet as droplets trailed off in front of me. Just an animal, I thought. I'll follow the trail of blood like I've done a million times before. I moved as quickly as I could manage without alerting the thing to my presence. Twice my foot fell on twigs that snapped, making me freeze until my I could hear over the thundering of my heart. The creature, the monster, had moved fast. Soon enough the drops of red became more sparse. It had lost a lot of blood, but still it ran. I brought my infrared camera to my face and surveyed the forest around me. The trees were dense this far in, and I had little hope of seeing the thing hidden in the underbrush. The camera stripped the world of its color, turning the trees to gray sketches of themselves. As I scanned the area around me, a bright pulse of orange and red appeared to my right. It was a mound of color, its center dark purple through my camera lens. From what I could tell, it was no more than a few yards from me through trees. As I held my camera steady, the shape began to morph. It unfurled itself from its crouched position, standing to its full height. The orange figure cast an aura of color onto the colorless trees, but it didn't move. It stood still, and in the shifting colors I could tell that its chest was heaving. I stared at it, afraid to move, to give myself away. Through my scope it looked human. It couldn't be, though. The thing I trapped had been nothing short of monstrous. Had I lost its trail? Had I stumbled on another person out here? Who's there? I shouted into the trees, my voice wavering and unsure. That might have been the stupidest thing I'd ever done, I thought. But still, I couldn't risk shooting a person. I didn't have much time to consider it. The thing gave an inhuman shriek and bolted through the trees. That answered my question. I raised my rifle and got off a single shot. It ripped through the tree limbs, but hit only air. Shit! I yelled. Before I knew what was happening, I was running through the woods. Not away from the thing like a normal, sane person, but toward it. If it was running from me, it was scared. I had the upper hand. I could end this. It thrashed through the underbrush, its previous stealth forgotten. It was easy enough to follow. I ignored the persistent voice in my head telling me to turn back, to forget this thing and never return to these woods. Through my infrared camera, I saw its orange glow retreating through the trees. Even distorted through the lens, its movements looked human. I dropped the camera back down to my chest and redoubled my pursuit. I knew it was the monster. It had to be. Its arms swung wildly longer than any human arms. The camera was playing tricks on me, or the creature was. It didn't take long for me to gain ground on it. It was in front of me now, hunched and awkward in its movements. Its head twisted back around to look at me, 
furred face contorting into a grimace. It really was like something out of childhood stories, the wild man of the woods. In the stories my grandmother told me, the wild man could tear its prey apart with bare hands. Instinctually, I raised my rifle, still gaining on the thing, though slowed significantly. The creature let out an awful shriek and fell, tangled in its own feet and sprawling out over a rotten log. I lowered my rifle and ran to catch up, gaining the few yards quickly. The thing had turned over onto its back, staring up at me from the leaf-strewn ground. Its thick chest rose and fell rapidly. It was afraid, this clawed monster that had ripped deer and cattle apart like tissue paper was afraid. I licked my lips half in fear, half in anticipation of the kill, and raised my rifle to my shoulder. Please, the creature said, its voice cracking. I lowered my rifle. Before my eyes, the thing shifted. Its face morphed like ripples clearing on a lake, changing from the wild man of my nightmares to a pincered bug, to a panicked man, his face crumpled in pain and fear. Please, it whispered. I don't know what you are, but please don't hurt me again. There was a man before me dressed in hiking gear, his shoulder stained crimson red. He lay sprawled pitifully on the ground. What are you? I demanded. I'm a hiker, that's all. Please. No, I saw. I trailed off. It made no sense. The man sat up, pain passing over his expression. I raised my gun back to my shoulder. He didn't charge me, didn't make any move to attack. What are you? I asked again through gritted teeth. Please, I told you, came the reply. I don't know what you are, but please, I just want to go home. Something about the man's tone of voice softened my resolve. I thought about the hiker that they pulled out of these woods, about the monster he said he stabbed. I kept my rifle trained on his chest. If you are what you say you are... Get up and leave. The man nodded and rose unsteadily to his feet, and my gun rose to meet him. He shifted again, body changing from man to shaggy beast and back again. My finger trembled above the trigger. Leave, I yelled. I could hear the panic in my own voice and hope that the man or beast or whatever the hell it was couldn't hear the same. The man bristled. I watched through my scope as he backed into the trees. When he was out of my sight, I lowered my rifle and let out a long breath. I raised my camera to my eyes and watched the figure of a man retreating through the trees. It was an hour or more before I turned to walk back out of the woods. I wish I could tell you that it all stopped, that Culver never found an eviscerated cow again, that hikers never wandered into those woods and hacked each other to pieces, that the Forest Service didn't shut it down after the deer all disappeared but that would be a lie. I don't know what I saw in there. Hell, I don't know for sure that I saw anything. All I know is that I'll never go hunting again. I was bow hunting with my uncle up north Michigan. It was about three, four hours of hearing and seeing nothing. All of a sudden, I hear the angriest, weirdest, and most pissed-off growl I have ever heard. I looked down from my tree stand carefully and seen something that kind of looked like a small black bear. But I've never heard a bear sound like that. I noticed it had loose, flappy skin when it walked. And it hit me. I am right next to a G-damn wolverine. When I realized, I knocked my arrow to my bow, and when I did, it instantly hurt it and looked straight up at my soul. I have never been so still in my entire life. It eventually thought it was nothing and kept going along, growling like a pissed-off baby black bear. Also, wolverines are known to mess up grizzlies and kill other animals like nothing. They climb trees like they are a damn house cat. I would have been ground beef if he caught me. I look over to check my uncle. He is standing on his tree stand, and he was keeping the wolverine at gunpoint for me the whole time, and I didn't even notice. We make eye contact, and he screams, was that a wolverine? Yep, I said. I was 16 when that happened, and I will never see such a rare, wild encounter like that again. They're extremely rare up in Michigan. 
you basically got to be around the Canada area to even have a chance to be near one from what I've heard. I was hunting deer alone and shot a buck from much longer range than I should have. It looked like it was badly wounded, but it managed to run away. I gave chase, and for most of that, while it was out of my sight. After a mile or so of running, I caught sight of the buck a couple hundred feet away. The animal was not moving and had been finished off by another hunter. That person was at the buck's rear end and looked like he was humping it. I didn't even consider getting a closer look at that point. I might have had a legitimate claim to part of the buck's corpse, but claiming the meat was the last thing on my mind. I bolted out of there faster than I could have managed while chasing after it, praying the whole time he didn't notice me. As long as there's crazy deer, humpers in the woods, I'm not going back there. At 4 a.m., I found myself walking to my deer blind deep in the wilderness, far from the closest house, which was a good ten miles away in any direction. It was an eerie and solitary walk, as I knew I wasn't well known in that remote area. The darkness was thick around me, punctuated only by the distant stars in the sky. It felt like I was the only human presence for miles. As I continued on my path, I suddenly heard a female voice, a chilling and haunting scream repeatedly calling my name. The hair on the back of my neck stood on end, and a shiver ran down my spine. It was inexplicable. There was no logical reason for anyone to be out here in the middle of the night screaming my name. I considered the possibilities. My dad, who was usually not an early riser, couldn't possibly have known which hunting spot I had chosen for the day, nor could he have woken my mother, who was the complete opposite, a light sleeper and a morning person, to beat me to my hunting spot and then return before me with a cold car. The mystery deepened as I strained to locate the source of the voice. The forest was silent and the only sounds were the distant rustling of leaves and the occasional hut of an owl. It was as though the very woods themselves were echoing the call of the mysterious voice. Now when I think about it, it might be Wendigo. I'm from eastern Tennessee, but when my encounter happened, I was working up in and around Clintwood, Virginia close to a town called Pound, Virginia, for two weeks. The encounter happened at an old sawmill out in the woods. There was only one way in and out of that location that I was aware of, and I had been hearing strange noises like whistling and twigs breaking. Along with that, I had a strange feeling of being watched. Now, I have seen some weird things in my life without explaining what they were, but what happened that day, I cannot explain it. Every time I go to talk about this, I just start worrying and thinking about my encounter again. I can barely sleep at night and have nightmares about my encounter. I saw something that made me for sure believe that there are creatures in this world that do not want to be found until they show themselves to you. This happened at 1.44 p.m. on September 22, 2020, and lasted not even five minutes when I saw the creature. The howls and other noises happened in the evening hours, the evening when I saw the creature, and the next evening. Throughout the time, I was out there working. I came to my service truck to get a Coca-Cola out of my cooler, and I heard something make a loud growling sound. It sounded off in the woods, so I looked around. Nothing. Then I heard it again and it up on this cliff, peeking out of the brush. I saw this large black thing. When I'd look at it had again, luckily I got one picture. I will say that I know it wasn't a bear. My initial thought seeing the black coloration was that it was a bear, but I realized it wasn't because bears didn't move like that thing did. It was larger than any bear and it was on two feet. I don't know how to explain it because it's just out of place, but then it started peeking around the brush. That's when I got out my phone and snapped the picture. 
But when I tried to start to record a video, my phone died and I had around 70% battery. Then my phone came back on about five minutes after it disappeared because I kept up with the time in the pickup and my phone still had that percent battery left. I had always believed they existed, yet I had my skepticism and had heard stories about Bigfoot, but never had my close-up encounter. But that day it happened. I will say, looking at the pictures after I zoomed in, I realized this may or may not have been Bigfoot, but something totally different. I want to share this. I don't want to hide my story because it just takes one person to make others share their encounter. It needs to be told. I feel the public needs to know things are out there. My guess was that the creature I saw was easily over seven feet tall, if not bigger. I estimate that it was over 600, 700 pounds. I have. Also found tracks, and I have pictures of the tracks. I have a picture of my boot next to the tracks, and they were bigger than my boot. I wear a size 12, but I will say there are really no definitive toes in the tracks. But they are massive tracks. I will gladly answer any questions, and I also have the audio of the howls I recorded. But like I said, my phone was still messed up and I couldn't use video or camera on my phone when the creature was there. And whenever the creature was around, it was weird that this thing could mess with technology. I'm just writing this in hopes that other people may have experienced similar things, perhaps to feel less lonely going through all this by myself or similar experiences, as well to maybe see what others' thoughts are. Some background. I'm in my mid-thirties, work a corporate job and have some side projects, live a pretty normal life, you could say. I've been practicing mindfulness meditation and some yoga now on and off for a good number of years, really just to manage the stress of job and life, not for any other particular reason. So about a year ago, I started having these weird experiences happen only during my meditation, things that are not necessarily normal or typical experiences I've had over the years of practicing meditation. The shortest explanation is that I start seeing spirits or beings within my minds. I, which I mostly just chalked it off as imagination, being tired and what not. However, they kept getting a bit more and more obvious and different to me. An example is that it always happens instantly before I can somewhat consciously imagine something. Again, difficult to explain, but it gets slightly more intense. As of recently, I've started actually catching glimpses of what I interpret to be dead people's relatives standing or hovering over them out of my peripheral vision. This is a whole other topic, but what's really got me going is my dreams. To me, dreams have mostly been just dreams. Lately, within the last few months, however they've become, I don't even know what word to use. But let me try and explain, and the details and experiences of these dreams are completely new to me. So normally, when I dream, it's never connected or follows a tangible, rational storyline or whatever. Now, it's taken on such a drastic turn. I legit feel as if my consciousness within the dream itself bounces between past or future, or things outside the scope of time, which is another difficult thing to try and explain. Let me give you an example. Dreaming in first or third person view is not new to me. However, dreaming in first and third person view simultaneously is new to me. Last night I was with two people. One where a young man in his mid-forties was with his wife, who was equally as young, was on her deathbed. I was watching this occur from the side in third person while simultaneously experiencing perspectives of both the man and the woman. As she was going through the transition of life to death, I experienced both the grief of the man and the sheer and overwhelming sense of peace and lightness. The woman was experiencing as her spirit slowly lifted above and out of her body, as if a huge sense of relief, knowing that all is okay as she dies. The night prior, the same situation occurred, however, this dream was military-focused. I'm not, 
nor have I ever been in the United States military. There was a group of four or five USA firemen providing some time of air support to a ground mission out in Middle East. It was a covert op, so no one was supposed to know they were engaging, but they were engaging using this. New type of what I thought looked like a Raptor drone that had way more maneuverability and speed than I believe the modern ones. It took four or five of these soldiers to operate the craft, and what I thought was strange was that they were operating this craft from another aircraft that was operating miles away. Same scenario here. I was experiencing and watching this all happen simultaneously from the first-person perspective of one of the pilots or airmen, who was actually pretty skilled and smart, utilizing low altitude and mountains to remain undetected, while watching almost all of this happen in a 360-degree view, almost like a mini-map in a video game, but in 3 After coming over the mountains, they unleashed attacks in a town, or what I thought was some type of market, like town in the middle of the desert. They were after a single individual, who they did not get with the airstrike but I didn't seem to see any casualties either. This is already long ass, so thanks to whoever who read all this. Perhaps I'm just slowly losing my mind or whatever. The hardest part is trying to explain this to people around me. I have some other strange things that have happened recently, but I'll save that for now. Thanks for letting me vent. So my parents were asleep in the living room of our townhouse, and I was sleeping upstairs in my room. I'm usually a really heavy sleeper, so the house could be falling down around me, and I would totally sleep right through it. When I finally woke up in the middle of the day, my parents told me that one of my cats had woken both of them up with an incredibly loud meow, unlike anything they've ever heard before. It was so loud that my mom yelled for me when she heard it but I was passed out upstairs. They were worried that he may have been having a health crisis, but when my mom checked on him, he was just sitting in front of the stairs, staring up at something in the stairwell. Some backstory for context. When we moved into this place over two years ago, my mom and I noticed right away that the house is haunted. She and I compared stories of seeing and feeling spirits when we're alone, mostly when we're in our rooms just lying in bed. For example, we keep noticing spirits of animals climbing in bed with us, which at first we think it's one of our cats, but when we check, we don't see anything, or the door to my mom's room is closed at the time. She notices this. One night, she told me that she was in the living room with the TV off, just messing around on her phone, and she happened to look up at the TV and saw a ghostly head coming out of the kitchen wall that resembled a sugar skull. The point is, I believe that the house is haunted by the ghost of the former owner, as well as a few animal spirits that may have followed us between houses. And just a few months ago, my great, uh, aunt, who was 102 years old, passed away in my bathroom upstairs. My cat, the one who scared the shit out of my parents, was really close to her when she was still alive and I get the feeling that that's who both of my cats have been seeing lately whenever they stare up at the stairwell. I should add that my mom and I have never gotten a bad feeling since we've started living here. Any spirits that are here are pretty tame and have never given us issues. They do like to be acknowledged, though. I'd like to tell you about an experience I had recently that honestly disturbed me. I don't know if it was real, a nightmare, or something else, but I can't explain it. First of all, you need to know that my bedroom and my mother's bedroom are opposite each other. So from my door, I can see my mother's bedroom, which is at the end of the corridor. What's more, my window faces my door, and therefore my corridor. It was the middle of the night, and the moon was shining brightly, so it was quite easy to see the bedroom and the corridor without too much difficulty. During the night, I woke up and was facing my window, curled up on top of myself. That's when I saw a face opposite my bed that I could well describe to you. It was a young man, I'd say in his twenties, with a fairly thin face and hollow cheeks. 
He had red hair, short with curls on top. The most terrifying thing about him was that he was looking towards my bedroom door with a horrified look frozen on his face. He didn't move as if it was a painting I was seeing, but he looked so real. At that moment, I had a feeling of terror that ran through my body. I was still curled up, and I didn't dare move or turn round towards my door where the young man was looking. My body was telling me not to move. My eyes were glued to the side, and I couldn't move. My body froze. I felt sick to my stomach, and I had the feeling that if I moved anything, serious was going to happen. I stayed like that for a few minutes. And then, at one point, it was completely calm. The young man was gone, and it was quiet. Maybe a little too quiet, like the calm you feel when you realize what's just happened. After that, I couldn't contain myself from turning back towards my corridor. And that's when I caught sight of a silhouette. It was transparent, but it was as if you could see the outline of its silhouette. I can't explain it. But the only thing I know is that when I looked at this thing, I, I didn't feel at all comfortable, and I was even a little scared. After all that, I didn't look far and went back to sleep, as if nothing had happened. It wasn't until the next day that I thought about it again, and I spoke to my mother about it, but she couldn't come up with an explanation either. Last year in Fairbanks, Alaska, I was heading south on Auburn Drive towards Farmer's Loop, which was about a mile away. It was a wooded area frequently visited by homes and, in general, considered a populated area. The houses were, on average, about 100 to 200 feet apart, with only the immediate vicinity around the homes cleared out. Most of the area was densely wooded. This section of the road passed by Pearl Creek Elementary School, and you could catch glimpses of the school through the woods. Some parts of the woods in the area were quite thick, making it difficult to see beyond about 10 or 15 feet. However, in this particular area, it had seemingly been cleared out quite a bit, allowing for open sight lines into the sections of the woods. You could see the school in a vegetable garden off to the right from the road. It was around 6 p.m., and I was heading home after a day of working on a deck that I was building. The weather was clear with the sun high in the sky. As I was driving, I happened to notice a man standing by the right side of the road about a hundred yards ahead. It was more of an unconscious recognition, as there was nothing unusual about a man standing on the side of the road in this area. As I got within about 50 yards, I looked closer and said to myself, That's no man. Shortly after that, in a second or two, he bolted into the woods toward the school, moving like a wild animal would when spooked. I didn't slow down until I reached the spot where I'd seen him enter the woods, and that's where I stopped. I could see him running away from the road, and when he was about 30 yards into the woods, he turned left, running parallel to the road in the same direction I was heading. I got a good look at him, but I couldn't see his face. I might have seen it if I hadn't been so mesmerized and had the presence of mind to look at it. I was preoccupied with other details. His fur or hair looked to be about three to four inches long, all over the main part of his body. It was a reddish, rusty color, and I was mildly struck by how red it was, but it definitely had a rustiness to it. He was about six feet tall and appeared to weigh around 200 pounds. He had a peculiar hoppy kind of run. It wasn't a limp with one foot. The foot he pushed off with was more pronounced than a normal running motion. The other foot he pushed off with propelled him upward about a foot or less and forward. I watched him until he disappeared into the woods. There was a road about a hundred yards ahead, and I headed towards it, turning right and then right again, leading to the road that led to the Sioux parking lot. The wooded area he was in seemed like a peninsula, so he had to be in there somewhere. The woods I was looking into from that angle were quite thick, and I didn't see him. I haven't seen him since. A little farther up on the right was the school garden, which had people in it around 7 to 10. In hindsight, I regret not stopping to talk to them about it. The next day, as I was driving to work on the deck, I naturally slowed down in the area. 
I stopped and surveyed the area when I saw a couple walking their dogs approaching. I flagged them down and shared the story of what happened the evening before. They told me that about a week ago, they were there with their dogs on their way to the other side of the school property by the soccer field when three kids came running over to them, asking, Did you see Sasquatch? They also mentioned that what appeared to be a dad was with them, who didn't seem excited about it. In conclusion, whether it was real or not, I can only say that it was either a genuine encounter or a person in an incredibly convincing costume. I reported it to the Fish and Game Office in Fairbanks a couple of days later. The person taking the report seemed to be somewhat skeptical, but I insisted he take my phone number just in case. I was driving my girlfriend home from work. Both of us lived in a suburb of our small town. So the drive from her workplace is relatively short. The only off thing about our encounter was the fact we saw it in a suburb, as opposed to the wooded or rural areas like other encounters. The moon was full, so we had a lot of light to see, but there were many mature trees in the yards of the houses surrounding the road we were driving on. All we saw was a large black blur, moving very fast, almost as fast as a greyhound at full speed. The length of the blur made me estimate it to be six to seven feet. Both of us were shaken by the experience and headed home immediately. When we got home, my girlfriend and I recanted our experience with her family, who laughed at us for telling them we had seen such a thing. They brushed it off as a tall tale and went on with their nightly activities. My girlfriend's two younger siblings were planning on playing a game called Manhunt. It's pretty much just like hide-and-seek. When the two of them headed out, not even two minutes after they walked out the door, they both bolted in, clearly upset and shaken. They both said they saw exactly what my girlfriend and I saw, but when they saw it, it was walking on its hind legs under a street lamp. Because of that, they got a clear view of it. They said it was dog-like and was walking on its hind legs on the street. After hearing that, we all as a group of witnesses headed out in my car to search for the beast and to warn the other kids playing manhunt about the beast. My girlfriend's siblings have stopped playing manhunt after their experience, and now that we all have a name to what we saw, we are all more shaken, wondering if it will be back. I personally did not see it, but a non-commissioned officer I work with, along with his wife, child, and hunting buddy, were on their way home. According to them, a large, hairy, approximately seven-foot-tall ape-like creature crossed the road in front of them. From what I could gather, none of them are familiar with Bigfoot information. Anyway, they say it crossed the road, which is about 35 feet in width and four to five steps. It seemed to disappear into the brush on the other side, which leads to a river called the Chenna. Both of the guys have been hunting since childhood and are confident they can recognize a bear when they see one. The creature crossed the road on its hind legs, and as we all agreed, yes, a bear can raise up on its hind legs and even take a few clumsy steps. However, crossing a 35-foot road, no way. They said they even came back later to look for tracks. He wasn't too sure, but he said he found some tracks that didn't look like any tracks he was familiar with. They were pointed inwards, like a person who is what I call pigeon-toed. They heard or saw nothing else, but were a bit shaken and headed home. The entire story seemed incredible to me because the incident took place on a military installation. I really don't want to get the guys involved because they fear ridicule. Well, I wasn't hunting at the time, but at the age of six, I was exploring the wooded area inn between my grandparents' house and a retirement community, and I stumbled upon what I believed to be a large gummy toy snake. I proudly paraded my new snake all through the surrounding parks and neighborhoods before I returned home. My new friend was immediately confiscated by my grandmother, 
and it took me until high school to understand why my grandfather almost died laughing at me. I had discovered an abandoned 14 double-ended dildo. In August of 2006, I was working in Northern California and was interested in finding Bigfoot prints. I have a friend who is a member of the Hoopo First Nation. I contacted him and then spoke to an elder. I was taken to an area where some footprints had just been found. Being skeptical, I took my right boot off and stepped down next to the footprint. I am seven foot one tall and weigh 395 pounds and wear a size 17 street shoe or a size 19 boot, as boot sizes are often mislabeled. I am of Scott and Lakota Sioux lineage and speak a number of First Nation languages. After putting on my boots, we heard a screaming howl. My friend started saying, Oh, Ma was coming and we had to leave. My friend Dave told his elder about what I had done and we went back to the site three hours later. There were numerous large footprints surrounding mine in what I believed to be a large finger hole in the middle of my footprint. I was contacted a couple of weeks later and invited back to the reservation as they normally lose a good portion of their apple crop to Oh, Ma, but in 2006 they didn't lose anything. They wanted to know if I could come back every year and walk around barefoot to intimidate Oh Ma and if I have any big friends my size. Oh Ma either saw me with the much shorter native Indians and thought I was another Oh Ma or recognized the footprint as a threat. The elder thought Oh Ma didn't want a confrontation with something almost as big as he and left the area. The old ma footprint was the same length as mine, but an inch and half wider at the ball and three-quarter of an inch wider at the heel. The depth of the print was the same. I've spoken with some so-called experts from the BF row and from the Bigfoot Discovery Project and got laughed at, but then they wanted me to come with them and speak to the Bigfoot via bullhorn and either native language. I'd rather not be used by someone who is too narrow-minded for me to speak to the Konopayokis, literally the people of the north who don't comb their hair, Bigfoot. I have seen a werewolf creature. It spoke to me and ran toward me. I was 14, so over 20, eight years ago. I had been using IUI job boards for weeks prior with my friend Angela, and had contacted what we thought was a little girl named Emily Carter. My friends and I were up front of my house when our friend Michelle started skipping and acting like a young child. A very odd vibe was present. Angela and I called out to Emily, and with that, my hand on my heart and on my three children's lives, a large wolf figure appeared instead of my friend Mikhail levitated and in this voice deep growly said don't ever call me emily carter again sit then at an intense speed ran towards us angela and myself with that it was gone and michelle was back to normal the thing is both angela and i saw this she spoke first so i know it was not just me it happened for years i have tried to make sense of it research what it was look at why it happened I experienced many odd things at that time. I believe, due to using the Elijah board, I never after this, nor ever will use it again, after that experience. If I had not experienced it, I wouldn't believe it, so I'm not asking for belief. Simply letting you know, I've seen it too and believe you. Yet on the positive, it's shown me dark, and in doing so, confirmed, there has to be light. This happened in an area of Kentucky called Kettle Creek on 500 acres called God's Land when I was a teenage girl. I walked up on this thing bent over in the berry bushes after crossing a tiny creek. I had a friend's dog with me and she spotted it before I did. The dog went crazy like I had not seen her do before. She was lunging at the thing, snarling, barking, growling, and snapping the air toward this thing. I was glancing back and forth between the dog and what I thought was a black bear. 
The dog is trying to keep the focus on the creature so I could escape. I'm freaking out inside my head as I'm deathly afraid of bears. As my eyes went back to the creature, it stood up. It was now facing me. It had its head barely turned as I watched as it looked at both me and the dog simultaneously. There was no expression on its face that I could tell except something that seemed serious. I locked eyes with it for several seconds and couldn't understand what I was looking at. I had a full view of its face taking in as much detail as I could, even though I was scared witless. Its face was not of a bear, no snout or protruding nose. It had hair outlining the structure of its face, black with a reddish tint around the forehead and its cheeks. The eyes seemed to hold an expression, but I couldn't read it. I was perplexed at what I was seeing. There was no beard or mustache on its face, but there was hair across the upper part of the cheeks. The face seemed rounded. The eyes were big and glistened. Dark brown eyes with a hint of white along the outer side of the eyeballs. The lashes were dark, not sure if it was black or dark brown. The nose was sort of like a human nose, but much bigger and slightly spread out. Its mouth was big, almost too big. The lips were thin. I never saw any teeth. Thank the stars for that. For some reason, my eyes were glued to its mouth. I don't understand why. Then I heard the words it said, Control the dog or it will be no more. At that point, I looked at the dog and tried to coax her to me. I looked back at this thing and couldn't figure out how it spoke to me without its mouth moving. My eyes were fixed on the mouth again, and I again heard the same words, but this time more demanding. I grabbed the dog by the scruff and tried to pull her alongside me, but she broke my grasp. As I looked up at this thing, I was staring at the eyes which were focused down on the dog. I know if I didn't grab the dog again, it would die. So I grabbed a firmer grip and I pulled her to me. A strange ease surrounded me and the dog as I began pushing it to my left and off the boulder at my back. As I pushed the dog further, my eyes were on the dog and not this thing. I released my grip on the dog and she took off without me towards the front meadow. I turned briefly back toward this thing to see it slightly turning and bending back down in the blackberry bushes. Then... I saw it had swaying breasts. It was a female. Why didn't I look at the full body? I decided to leave this thing be since it didn't hurt me or eat me like the stories I had heard from the people around this land. That night, just before the sun went down and I heard a voice in my head. This time it felt deeper than the first. It said, now that you have seen us, we will have to come get you. That voice scared me so badly that I packed up all my things and left early the next morning. I didn't say anything to anyone on the land. I couldn't tell them something I had no clue about. I understood from the second voice it was her brother and not sure what he meant by coming to get you. I think in a way this was the opening for my learning from them and about them. I had no knowledge about Bigfoot until the early 1990s. That's when I first saw snippets of the Patterson or Gimlin film. I didn't even know other people had experiences. I didn't even know that there were more than those I had experienced until I saw that film. I hitchhiked all over the United States and stayed alone in my travels. I didn't like traveling with other people. I liked being able to take my time or travel swiftly to my next destination. It's unheard of these days for a young teenage girl to hitchhike the U.S., but that was my life, and I loved it being able to live in the peaceful wilds. My grandmother passed away in a horrific way. She was neglected by her caregiver, the person she loved the most. He was physically present, but was not unkind to her in her last months. He was just a lazy, ignorant, and unpleasant individual. Because of him, I stopped visiting. He was not only my half-brother, but had been an abuser throughout my life. Then something strange happened. I heard my grandmother's voice telling me that my aunt was mean and a traitor, trying to claim half of her house. We had discussions about it, not confrontational, but more like back and forth conversations as I defended my aunt, believing she wasn't like that. However, it turned out my aunt was indeed expecting to receive half of the house. 
This left me puzzled, wondering about the true nature of the situation. I'm a female, and this story takes place during my junior year of high school at the time and had a group of friends that I'd hang around with, but I had a really close friend that we will call Amy. Amy and I were very close and even hung out when our friend group was not around. During school lunch, I was hanging out with my group when a guy in my group, who we will call Bob, introduced us to a guy who we will call Mason. He was short and had glasses, basically a freshman. Me and my friends gladly accepted him into our group, thinking nothing bad would happen. I mean, what harm can one person do? Well, things started off tame with. He'd make somewhat sexual jokes to me in Violet, which we just awkwardly laughed off. But things escalated to the point where we purposefully dead named my friend Amy, which made her really mad. She tried to not interact with him, but everyone apparently saw him as a funny guy and kept him around. One day, Mason made a sexual joke towards Violet while she was eating a banana. I'm sure you can guess what the joke was. Long story short, we reported him to the principal, and Amy had a five feet apart order on the guy. We thought we were safe. After all, he was leaving us alone, and the most he would do is give us death glares. Which, of course, I found strange, but he really wasn't doing any harm. About a week later, I was called down to the office. I was nervous, I mean. I didn't think I did anything wrong. When I got to the office, there was Mason, Amy, our school's officer, and a weird journal. I was really confused until I was told to sit down and the principal slid the journal over to me. Apparently, he had a hit list for me, Amy, and a bunch of other kids who had apparently wronged him. The creepiest thing is, he brought a gun to school, which is why the school's officer was there. Apparently, Mason was in math class whenever he tried to pull his gun out completely. Luckily, someone saw him pulling it out and alerted the teacher. Ever since then, he has been leaving me alone. Me and my friend group unfortunately grew apart, but this story still makes me feel scared. I was in New Orleans for a work conference. I was early for dinner, so I was seated at a little table next to the piano for a cocktail before my party came. This man was at the adjacent table, and we started talking. Very benign. Seemed fine. The waitress came up to him and sternly said, I know you want to keep talking to this young lady, but if I don't seat you now, you will lose your table. He left and was seated. The waitress came back to me and told me that the man paid for my drink. That's fine, and I said, tell him thank you. Minutes later, a waiter came over and told me that he'd like for me to join him since he's dining alone. I told him to tell him thank you, but I'm waiting for my party. I'm seated with my group, and his table is right next to ours, and he is staring the entire time while he is eating. It was unnerving. But like, okay, maybe he thought I was an escort. I don't know. The rest of my party noticed, too. And well, after he was done eating, he stayed at the table and continued to watch me. Fast forward to the next night, I go meet some friends at a hotel bar to listen to live music. Mind you, this is in a completely separate part of town. New Orleans is huge. I go to the bar to grab a drink, and this man is at the bar again staring at me with almost a disdain. I've had maybe three other occurrences in my life where I felt this deep, unsettling feeling. Was he following me? What are the odds we would be in the same place? I had a terrible dream last night that I was stuck in an elevator with this man, but I didn't know it was him, and he found where I lived and tried to break in. It felt like a psychic attack, a deep, unnerving, violating feeling. I've dealt with plenty of creeps, but this was different. This happened not too long ago, although not too crazy. Definitely had me freaking out after it occurred. Probably did not help that I frequent this sub often. 
I had just moved to a new apartment building, and it was my first time living alone. It was actually my first day, and I had moved my stuff in and headed to school and was coming home for the evening. My parking is in an underground basement, which was scary as is for the first few days, so I would always leave my car and book it to the elevator so I could get the F out. As I stood waiting, it was taking quite a while for the elevator to come down, and I could hear it beeping on the different floors it was stopping at. Once it finally arrived, the doors opened, and there was a tall guy that was clearly disheveled or on something. The minute I made eye contact with him, my senses went off, and I got the most uneasy feeling. I hesitated as I was on the last floor, so whenever someone was in the elevator, they were always getting out, and I waited for him to do the same. Instead, he just stood there staring at me, and I managed to blurt out, Are you going up? He mumbled some sort of, Yeah. Alarm bells were going off, but I thought maybe I was overthinking, so I awkwardly walked in and stood against the wall as far as I could from him. I asked him what floor, as there was no floor selected, and he stuttered between numbers, and happened to say the same floor I was getting off on which scared me even more. I tried to not panic, but as soon as I entered, I tried to keep my gaze down, but he was just facing and starting at me with the most uncomfortable look in his eyes. The minute the elevator started going up, he started to shuffle and was moving towards me when it ended up stopping on the first floor on the lobby. I was in the left corner near the doors, and he was basically right in front of the door, stepping towards me when the doors opened. I was honestly freaking the actual hell out, and as soon as the doors slid open, I scooched out and went straight out the doors onto the main street. I stood there for a few minutes with my heart pounding because of how scared I was, and I remember him staring at me confused for a minute, and then he stayed back in the elevator as the doors closed. I remember there were two guys standing by in the lobby who witnessed the whole thing, and I nervously laughed that I was just creeped out by guy a guy in the elevator. I believe they were just door dashers, so they just stared at me and were like, okay, lie. I ended up taking the stairs up and was scared out of my mind. I was praying he was just someone's guest, hence why he was so confused and weird. My dad came to visit me the very next day, and I was telling him how badly that guy freaked me out, and that same night, we ran into him again. He was waiting for the elevator, and the minute I saw him, I told my dad and made him take the stairs with me again. Thank God I haven't seen him again, so I'm really hoping he was a guest. But if I ever see an elevator with just one dude in it, I do not take the risk law. May have just been me overthinking, but something was deaf not right with him. So, around 10, 45 in Axminster, United Kingdom, I was stargazing with my family. I was lying in a hammock, watching the stars, when my brother shouted for our attention, pointing to something strange in the sky. He said, yo, is that Santa? I jumped out of the hammock and ran over to where he was pointing, and I kid you not, there was this massive black line speeding across the night sky. The line was abnormally long. No aircraft could be that long. Its shape looked quite familiar. There were four of us who saw this, and we all agreed we could make out what looked like a sleigh at the start, and then some reindeer or something along the front as the front parts were moving in some way. But what was strange was it looked like there were way more than 12 reindeer, closer to 20-plus reindeer pulling the sleigh. We all stared at it while freaking out for about five, seven seconds, and then it went behind a tree and vanished. I have no clue what we just saw, but I'm posting this while my memory is fresh. We decided it was either Santa or a long-ass sky centipede. Wow, wow. So I've always brushed off paranormal activities as coincidence or have tried to find rational reasoning, even though I've always been intrigued by it. But lately, I have no way of explaining it to myself. So for some background, I've recently moved house. I used to live in a big old manor house. I'm not sure what year it dates back to, but it's next to its twin. 
The main house, which dates back to 1781, so I'm assuming it's around the same time frame. Obviously, with a building this old, it's very daunting and you'd assume it is haunted. It also got turned into an old people's home at some point in time, but I've recently moved to another house that dates back to the 1800s. Whilst I was in the manor house, me and everyone else living there would experience weird things. Nothing dangerous, but weird nonetheless. And we'd all brush it off as it's an old house and I was a kid. Things that would happen frequently, doors closing or opening. Electronics and light bulbs turning off and on, doors locking and loud noises coming from inside the bedrooms, like banging noises. I don't want to drag this on longer than it needs to be. I have a lot of experiences in that house, so if anyone wants a more in-depth explanation, feel free to ask questions, but to the point. I've always had extremely vivid dreams that feel and look real. To the point where when I wake up, I still believe I'm dreaming. Since moving to this house, the same things are happening. Lights turning on and off, etc. We had a weird experience with our Alexias playing music randomly. Old-timey music. But the thing that's making me feel crazy is the dreams. Just before I fall asleep, I keep hearing a man speaking in my room, as if he's next to me. It's that clear, but I'm always on the verge of sleep so I just brush it off as a dream. But what really got me was I got a phone call the other day from my mom whilst I was out asking me where I was. I had been out all day, and it was 2 a.m. at this time. She called me, and she had told me that she called out my name when I got home, and I responded, and she had a conversation with me, but it wasn't me because I wasn't home. She realized when she went to my room and I wasn't there. I need help and opinions. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.